And this is the College of Conference. Good evening, everybody. And uh, tonight we're going to learn about life, the universe, and everything, sort of. <laughs> sort of. And Matt Lowry will uh, tell us about it. Uh, on the basics of the Big Bang, evolution of the universe, the status of modern cosmology, and particle physics, and speculations on the multiple universes. Oh my, that's a mouthful. And it's all in this evening, till we get thrown out of here at 11. I'm really happy to be here because this is actually the third time I've spoken to the College of Complexes. And uh, uh, this is on a topic which is uh, really interesting to me. Um, you guys are going to get to see the most updated version of this talk. I've actually been giving this talk for many, many years. A um, little background in case you don't know anything about me. Uh, I'm both a high school and a college physics professor. Uh, and uh, I have taught astronomy before, and that's actually how I formulated this talk many years ago when I was teaching astronomy courses at the College of Lake County. Uh, and I have a shameless plug for my, my blog up there, in case anybody's interested in hearing my musings on science and whatnot. Yay! Uh, oh, thank you. <laughs> I have a fan already. And uh, my favorite cartoon ever, uh, and uh, I like to start by illustrating that cartoon because um, this is a this is a talk that's going to be grounded in science, okay? Which makes sense since I teach science. Uh, though I know that expecting it to just remain a scientific talk in this particular form is like trying to herd cats. So uh, I'm going to be presenting the science. Uh, anybody who wants to talk philosophy or theology, you know, hey, have at it. We'll we'll get to that later. Um, but uh, this talk is going to be a summary of the most up-to-date science that we have on cosmology, the evolution of the universe, where the universe came from, where we think it's going, and other interesting questions that were once perhaps the realm of philosophy. So with that, let's get started. Oh, one more thing. Um, as we're going along, if you need, a, if you need to you know, raise your hand and ask a real quick question for clarification or something like that, that's not a problem at all. Um, but if you have a, a longer question, please wait until the end to, to do that. Okay, so we can get through everything here. Because we have a lot to talk about. All right. Um, this first slide, I like to show this first slide because it uh, kind of illustrates uh, a, a very interesting point about the number of stars there are in the observable universe. And you're going to note that I'm very careful with my language. I'm saying the observable universe for a good reason. Okay, I'll come back to that clarification a little bit later. Um, but in the observable universe, we have approximately 100 billion galaxies. Okay, we have approximately 100 billion galaxies, like our own Milky Way galaxy, kind of like what's on my shirt. Right, the joke is, you are here, and the bathrooms are somewhere over there. Okay. In this picture right here on the on the left, it's a photograph from the Hubble Space Telescope. It's called the Deep Field View. In this photograph, pretty much every single dot of light that you see is a galaxy, like our Milky Way galaxy. And that is a that is a photograph of a section of sky which is, you know, like maybe this big from our point of view. It's fine. So, there's a lot of galaxies out there, and each one of those galaxies, like our own galaxy, contains approximately 100 billion stars, right? So you're talking about 100 billion galaxies, each with roughly 100 billion stars in our observable universe, which means we're talking about, in terms of pure numbers, about 100 billion, 100 billion stars in the entire observable universe, which, if you do scientific notation, comes out to a 1 followed by 22 zeros. A lot of stars out there. Now, if we just focus on a galaxy here, 
Uh, I like to show this image of the Andromeda galaxy to illustrate another point about uh, sort of the vastness of the universe. We, I just mentioned something to you about the universe being vast in terms of numbers of stars and numbers of galaxies. This slide is to help illustrate the vastness of the universe in terms of distance and size. The Andromeda galaxy uh, is a galaxy very much like our large spiral galaxy, but it is uh, very far away from us. And when you're talking about the size scales that we're talking about in terms of uh, distances to other galaxies and so on, we can't. I mean, we could talk about it. Whoops. We could talk about it in terms of miles or kilometers, but it's such a large size scale that the the numbers get so huge they kind of lose their meaning. So what we do is we use another unit uh, that's called the light year. And a light year is defined as the distance that it would take a beam of light to travel in one Earth year. And if you work that out by the numbers, it comes out to approximately 6 trillion miles. That's 6 times 10 to the 12th miles. 671 million. No, not million. It's, it's much more than million. million. Yeah, trillion. Um, and so what happens is... Um, when you think about a light year, if you are looking at an object that's one light year away, you are seeing it one year in the past. Because it took the light a year to get to you. Right? So you're not seeing the object as it is now, you're seeing it as it was a year ago. The Andromeda Galaxy, which is one of the largest galaxies, one of the, one of the big galaxies which is close to us, uh, is 2.3 million light years away. So let's just put this in perspective. When you see this picture, the light that made this image was released from the Andromeda galaxy at a time when our hominid ancestors were loping around the savannas of Africa, bashing their head over the head with a get bashing their food over the head with a club. Like now. Like now. That's a different talk, I guess. <laughs> um, back to this. <laughs> the uh, not going to go there. This uh, this picture, this light is two. It's a portrait that's 2.3 million years in the making. Now somebody asks, okay, well, what's the Andromeda galaxy doing now? We don't really know. We can project where it is now based upon how we how we saw it, how we see it moving in this image, and so on and so forth, but. Now, we don't really know exactly where it is right now because to know where it is right now, we'd have to wait another 2.3 million years. Right. Okay. So that's to give you an idea. Um, now, that's one galaxy, one of the bigger galaxies, which is closest to us, all right? 2.3 million light years away. Now let's talk about even larger size scales. This is a picture of a uh, galactic survey. And there are astronomers whose, whose careers are basically to use these huge telescopes and basically survey the sky and, and map it in terms of you know, placement of galaxies, where they're located, how far away they're located, and so on and so forth. And there's a whole bunch of stuff that goes into that. Um, but this is one of the uh, most uh, current databases of the mapping of galaxies in our universe. Now, to understand what this means, let me just point out a couple things. Right here in the middle, that's where we are. Okay? So we're looking out in this direction. The distance away, note it's in billions of light years, not millions anymore. Right? The Andromeda galaxy is like somewhere like around there. <laughs> okay? We're talking billions of light years now. And each one of these blue dots represents a single galaxy. Uh, the reason why you're seeing off in these directions and not over in this direction and this direction has to do with the placement of the telescopes on the Earth, right? You can only look at certain sections of sky because of how they're placed on the Earth. And when we look out, uh, we notice some really interesting features. Now, again, remember, when you're looking further away, you're looking further back in time, okay? Because it takes the light time to propagate to us. As we look further away, you notice that the galaxies, when we get to about 5 billion years ago, the galaxies are much more sparse than when we are looking at more recent time. Okay? So this gives us some kind of clue 
that when the universe was younger, we did not have as many galaxies out there. Or it's also a, a measure of the limitations on our detection equipment, right? Because the further away you look, the harder and harder it is to detect these things. And we are getting better at that. And we, but we still see this kind of pattern that the further in the past we look, the, there are fewer and fewer galaxies. Okay. Uh, yeah, this is approximately yeah, 100, 107,000 galaxies, roughly. Yeah. Um, now, there are a couple of other interesting features. Oh, where are the stripes? Ah, uh, yes, the stripes. Okay, I'll get to the stripes in a second. Uh, well, actually, let me just talk about stripes now. Uh, you may notice these stripes here. See these stripes like this? Like this, radiating out away from the Earth? What those are is those are areas where we can't get any data because our vision is blocked. Right? So we have something in the way, like a like the Orion Nebula, for example, which is very hard to see through, uh, or some other object. And we can't see through it, so we don't know exactly what's behind it, and because we don't know exactly what's behind it, it just comes out as a strike like this. Does that make sense? It's kind of like, think of that like a shadow, almost. That's basically what that is. In terms of years, how, how long do we have the ability to see that far away? Oh, um, this far away? Uh, I can't remember exactly, but I do know that I do know that in recent years we have developed the technology to see about as far back as if you're talking about visualizing with optical light galaxies. I think we can see about ten to twelve billion years back right now. Couldn't see oh no, we'll, we'll get into that. Yeah, we'll get, yeah. This is no. This is this is very recent stuff in the last couple of decades. Okay. Uh, the other thing, well, the other thing is you may notice it's patchy. Okay. So for example, you'll see you'll see regions where there's a lot of galaxies clustered together like this, and then you'll see regions where it's very kind of sparse. All right. And there's an interesting reason for that. We think we understand why we see that kind of pattern in this galactic distribution of galaxies. Now, on that last point about kind of the passiveness, oh, question. Uh, in reference back to the strikes, I'm sorry. Sure, let's I'm go back to the strikes. I'm still there. You said that we're looking at something that you can't see through, so it's blocking. Yeah, it's blocking what's behind it. So that's, that's like a shadow. Almost. But it, but it, what is it? We oh, it, it's, it's, it, there's a lot of things, you know, there's, there's various uh, objects out in the, in the universe, like a, like it's very difficult to see past our own uh, Milky Way galactic center. It's very dense. There's a lot of material, a lot of gas and dust in the way, and so it, it blocks our it blocks our vision in certain wavelengths of light. Do we have information on what that it is? Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, we we know what those things are. We just can't see past those. Okay. Yeah. What about black hole? Black holes. Um, black holes would give you a very different. We think kind of view for a variety of reasons. Um, and I'm not really going to get into black holes in this particular talk because there's so much going on with them that, yeah, that would take a long time. But if, afterwards, I can, I can tell you a few things about that. Okay, but it would take, it would take a good 10 to 15 minutes. Yeah, we can do questions later on that and more specific. That's, that's something that would require a little bit more of a detailed response. Um, okay, so on the point of this patchiness, right, if we take our best astronomical data to date, okay, and we put it together with information that we have in terms of computer models and how the laws of physics work and how we think the laws of physics work and whatnot, what we can do is we can, we can model what we think the universe, the observable universe, looks like right now. Okay. And these two pictures kind of give you an idea of that. The first thing to note is when we look at these, all of these, all, all of these data with these maps, we notice that there's a pattern in terms of that patchiness where you get large clumps of galaxies, like the red and the, the, red and, the and the orange here represent large clumps of galaxies. And they connect to other large clumps of galaxies by these very, very long sort of filament type structures. And all of these dots are galaxies in and of themselves. Now, remember the scale here. We're talking from one side of this picture to another is like billions and billions of light years. Okay? Those are very enormous structures. 
At the same time, in between these, this filamentary type structure, there's large gaps, there's large voids. And if we model this in computers, what we get is we get a, kind of a picture like this. Now, just to give you an idea of scale here, first of all, that red blob right there, that's not a single galaxy, that's what we call like a supercluster of galaxies, which contains hundreds of thousands of galaxies. Okay? And we come up with these kind of pictures that say this is what we think the observable universe looks like right now. And as far as we know, our best measurements seem to indicate that from one side to the other, the observable universe is approximately 90 billion light years across. That's nine zero billion light years across. Uh, so this picture right here, this whole thing right here, it only goes out to five billion light years. Uh, it would be, you know, kind of right in there somewhere. Okay. Uh, so we're talking a very vast structure. Now, I'm very careful with the language I'm talking about the observable universe because there's a couple of misconceptions that come along here. First of all, people who know uh, some basic facts about cosmology know that the universe, as far as we know, according to science, is about 14.7 billion years old. Now, this confuses some people because when I say that this observable universe is 90 billion light years across, they say, well, where do you get that number from if it's 14.7 billion years old? You would expect it to be maybe slightly under 30 billion light years across, right? Well, you have to remember that when the Big Bang got the universe going and everything started to expand, uh, and space time began to expand, that what we're talking about here is, remember, we're, we're seeing these things not as they appear now. Right, we're seeing them when the light left. So if you're looking at an object, just pick a number, if you're looking at a, a very young proto galaxy that's 12 billion light years away, you're seeing it as it looked 12 billion years ago. And that thing has moved since then. Right? And so what we do is we make projections using the computer models about where that galaxy and its associated cluster is now. And we're going to get into some ideas about the expansion of the universe and when you when you just a few minutes, but when you put all that together in the calculations. In the time it took the light from these very, very distant galaxies to get to us, the universe has expanded even more and gone now further. Right? So that's that's kind of resolves that apparent paradox. Question real quick. Yeah, well, uh, what's the current status of belief as to how far the universe extends beyond the limits <clears throat> of observation? Yeah. You mean beyond the cosmic horizon, the Hubble, the Hubble horizon? Yeah. The Hubble um, Hubble. I'll get into that towards the end of the talk. <laughs> that's going to be a real interesting. That's really interesting. Uh, we'll get into that when we talk about the multiverse stuff. Okay, anything else before we move on? Okay. If you think it's deep now, just wait. <laughs> it gets a lot deeper. Now, what I want to do, as I mentioned a few moments ago, uh, a couple of facts about cosmology. You know, the age of the universe is approximately 14.7 billion, billion years. The... Uh, <clears throat> universe is in a state of expansion. Um, and what I want to do real quick is I want to outline three primary lines of evidence that scientists have used to come to these conclusions. There are more lines of evidence than this, but these are the, these are the three big ones. Okay. The first has to do with this gentleman, Albert Einstein, uh, and his theory of general his theory of general relativity. Now General relativity is our best, most up-to-date theory of gravity. Okay, so it describes the physics of gravitation on the scale of the universe. Okay, and one of the key ideas behind the uh, theory of general relativity is that you you get the warping or the curving, if you will, of this stuff we call space-time. The idea is that space and time are not two completely separate entities. They are actually intricately intertwined with each other, and if you affect one, you affect the other. And one of the ways to affect space-time, to warp it, curve it, uh, whatever term you like to use, is to have a, a massive object like a planet or a star. And this picture is to kind of help you understand what we're getting at. If you imagine that a completely empty region of space-time, imagine it to be like a, a flat rubber sheet that's stretched out. Okay, 
And now you take a massive object like a, like a baseball, say to represent a planet, you plop it in the middle of that stretched rubber sheet, it's going to cause it to dip or pucker or bend, right? In very much the same way, um, the fabric of space-time is puckered or dented by massive objects like planets. And the more massive the object, the more pronounced that warping or bending of space-time. So if you put a bowling ball in the rubber sheet, it's going to bend even more, and so on. Now this has the effect of deflecting the light. It also affects the rate at which clocks tick. It affects time. That's an effect called gravitational time dilation. Oh, and just as a quick aside, anybody who doesn't believe that this is the real thing, we actually have technology. Anybody ever heard of GPS? Right? GPS technology is based in part on these ideas. So if, if this wasn't the real thing, GPS wouldn't work. Okay, so we actually have technology that we carry around in our pockets based on general relativity. Now, the thing about this is, if you take Einstein's equations for general relativity, and if you do what he did with the calculations back in, I think, 1917 or something, I can't remember the exact year, he applied his equations of general relativity for uh, the behavior of space-time to the universe at large, okay? And he found, upon doing these calculations, something that he did not expect. He found that, according to these calculations, they predicted that the universe would be in a state of expansion, that space-time itself would be stretching, okay? Now, I'm going to point out a rather embarrassing fact in Einstein's life, because he let his personal bias trump good science at this particular point. Some of you may already know about what I'm going to talk about. He called this the biggest blunder of his career because what he did is at the time the theory of the cosmos was what's called the steady state theory. And it was the idea that the universe was basically static okay, and, and, and fixed. Well, he, he, he does his calculations. He finds out that according to his theory it should be in a state of expansion, and he didn't like that result. So what he did is he added an extra term into the calculations that he called the cosmological constant, and that extra term would just, you know, poof, balance out the predicted expansion so that there would be no expansion at all, so that you would get a steady state universe. And for reasons which will become apparent a little bit later, uh, he said, wow, that was the biggest mistake I ever made. And don't forget about that thing called the cosmological constant. We'll come back to that because that's very interesting. All right. Now, if you talk about the predictions, the unadjusted predictions of Einstein's calculations, right, without him putting his little fudge factor in to get the result he wanted, um, what is, basically what, it, the, uh, what the theory predicts is that space-time itself will stretch. And this is a common misconception about the expansion of the universe. A lot of people think that what's going on is that when you talk about the expanding universe, you talk about the galaxies zipping through space. Okay? Um, kind of like if you set a firecracker off, the little pieces of the firecracker zip, zip through the air. But what we're actually talking about is the material of space-time itself if you will, I can't think of a better thing to call it, but space-time itself is expanding. So think of it um, kind of like, think of it kind of like this, okay? This is a nice picture. Uh, you've got this young lady who is blowing up a balloon, right? You see all these white dots on the balloon. And this is a neat little thing that you could do on your own very easily that kind of illustrates the point of the calculations. Um, and suppose each one of these dots represents a galaxy. Okay? Now, as you inflate the balloon, the distance between the galaxies, the distance between the dots on the balloon, gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Okay? And you can think of the surface of the balloon as the space-time fabric of the universe. Right? So this is, this is that stretched rubber membrane that I was talking about before. Think of that. And that, that surface, not the inside of the balloon, the surface of the balloon represents space-time. And that's itself actually stretching. And as it stretches, the dots are carried along with it. That, that's what Einstein's theory predicts. It also predicts a couple of other interesting things. Uh, this is something called the cosmological principle. This is really cool. You see that one dot right there, which is kind of circle? 
right? So suppose that's us. Suppose that's us in the Milky Way galaxy, right? What would we see if we look at all these other dots over time? Well, we would see them getting further away from us, right? But suppose you lived on another galaxy, say this one over here. As time went on, if you lived on that galaxy, what would you see all the other galaxies doing? Moving further away, right? The interesting point here is that according to the calculations that Einstein did, um, we, it doesn't matter where you are in the universe, you, you, you see everything moving away from you. And so sometimes people will ask, you know, well, where's the center of the universe? And the best way to answer that as far as I know is to say nowhere and everywhere at the same time. I told you it's going to get deep. <laughs> okay, I warn you. Now let's look at this graphic over here. This is just to kind of, again, illustrate this idea. This is also uh, going back to something that I mentioned before about the observable universe, right? Uh, let me clarify that. When I talk about the observable universe, I'm talking about the part of the universe that we have, have seen up until this point. Remember, we can't see it until the light gets to us. Now, the light has had about 14.7 billion years to propagate to us, but the universe is a really big place. So, as this gentleman in the back was mentioning about the cosmic horizon, basically what that is, is that's sort of the limit of our vision. We haven't seen past that point because the light from those distant objects hasn't gotten to us yet. If we wait a little bit longer, it'll get to us. And this picture over here is meant to illustrate that. So imagine we're talking about the early universe, right, where you've got all these galaxies that are, or matter and whatnot, that's closer together, right? Suppose you've got two proto-galaxies. Those are the little green dots right there. And as time goes on, space time expands, just kind of like this, right? And the dots, the galaxies are getting further and further apart, carried by this expanding space time. You see these red circles? Those red circles represent the light given off by those galaxies. Right? Now, looking at this picture right here, have the, have, if, there, if there are intelligent beings living on these two green dots, have they seen each other yet? Right? Has, has this red circle gotten to that green dot yet? No. So the light from this galaxy hasn't gotten to that galaxy yet. Right? So the observable universe for the beings on that green dot is the inside of this circle. Okay? Now, as space-time expands, as time goes on, you get, these, you, get, you get the galaxies expanding further apart from each other with space-time, and you see that the, the observable universe gets larger and larger, until eventually you get to a point where now, finally, the observers, on the, the, the people that live on this galaxy have seen that galaxy because its light has finally gotten to them, and vice versa. Does that picture make sense? Okay, that's what we mean by the observable universe. Okay, if you ask, well, what's what's out here? What's beyond? Answer: We don't know because we haven't gotten the light yet. We can't say. Okay, we have ideas, we have some speculations, but we can't really say for sure until we see it. Okay. Now, uh, this is another way of thinking of what I just mentioned. See this picture right down here? It looks like loaves of bread, and that's what they're supposed to be. Uh, another way of thinking of this idea of expanding space-time is to think about like making a, a loaf of raisin bread and then just stick it in the oven. Right? When, when, you, when you make raisin bread, uh, or pick your favorite fruit or whatever, right? and, you, and you put this in the oven, right? you've got the dough and the raisins are inside of the dough, and you heat this thing up. And when, and when this heats up, do the raisins start zipping through the dough like this, like little bullets? No. The dough itself expands and it carries the raisins with them. That's kind of the same thing that's happening with the expansion of the universe. And in this case, the dough is space-time, the raisins represent galaxies, and so on. Now, at, the same, at about the same time that Einstein was doing all of his theoretical calculations and kind of messing with calculations in a way that he probably shouldn't have been, this gentleman, Edwin Hubble, was doing some actual empirical research on galaxies. And in 1929, what Edwin Hubble did is he was able to publish a really interesting set of observations. Because what he had done for many, many years is he had been looking at these little cloudy smudges in the sky called nebula. You see, at the time that Edwin Hubble was doing his research, the, the scientific world thought that there was one galaxy, ours. They thought that, you know, like my shirt, 
right? They thought that was it. There was no concept that there were other galaxies. It was just, there was our galaxy, and then there were these little cloudy smudges called nebula. What Hubble did is he actually looked at all these little smudges, and he was able to find out, because the technology, the technology got better, he was able to discover that each of those smudges was another galaxy. And so he started cataloging them. And as he cataloged them, he noticed something really interesting. He noticed that when he looked at galaxies that were further and further away, there was something funky going on with the light that was coming from them. And this has to do with an effect we call the Doppler effect. Right? That's what this picture up here is about. Okay, you said, suppose you're standing out here on the street, right? You're standing out here on the street, and there's a, a, an ambulance or a fire truck or a police car running down the street, and it's got its siren wailing, right? And as it comes towards you, what's it sound like? Right? And then it goes past you, but it goes... That, that's an exaggeration, but you guys have all heard of that. That's the Doppler effect. The idea is that the thing that's emitting the waves, in this case, in the example I made, sound waves, the thing that's emitting the waves, as it moves towards you, the waves are bunching up. And when they bunch up like that, they shift to a higher frequency, so we perceive that as a higher pitch. As the object is moving away from you, if you're over here, you hear lower frequency waves that are stretched out, and that's lower pitch. Same thing happens with light. And what Hubble was able to observe is that when he looked at the light from these distant galaxies, he saw that the light was shifted towards the red end of the spectrum. Okay, Because when you, when you look at the light from things, what you can do is you can identify what they're made of by looking at what are called spectral lines in the light. And they form very specific patterns. Like this is how, for example, we know that the sun is made mostly of hydrogen. We know that hydrogen has a very specific pattern to the light that it emits. And we can see that pattern in sunlight when we analyze it carefully. Well, you look for those kind of lines and you notice that those lines are shifted. They're, 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 they're scooched over towards the redder end of the spectrum of light. And from that, what Hubble was able to do is he was able to infer that that means that these galaxies are moving away from us. Okay? Yeah, that's called the redshift. And this is, a, this is kind of an example of that. Now, on the, on the, on the left-hand side over here, what you see is an example of what I'm talking about. Now, it's a little bit fuzzy, and I apologize for that, but these are like original pictures from, gosh, I can't remember when. But if you look like right, okay, I'm going to try to, I'm not going to use my laser pointer because it's going to be tough to see with the laser pointer. If you look right where I'm pointing with my fingertip right here, can you see two dark lines in that horizontal smudge? Can you see those? Those are the spectral lines that I mentioned. In this case, I think they're spectral lines. I think they're for potassium, but I can't remember. Um, but anyway, when you look at a galaxy that's further and further away, right, you can see that these spectral lines, well, they're very, they're very hard to see here, but they're easy to see here, and they're very easy to see here. You can see they're shifted further that way. And this is the redder end of the spectrum. This is the bluer end of the spectrum. So what you can infer is... Not only are these galaxies far away from us, but they are also, the further away they are, the faster away from us they're moving because they have a more, pronounced, more pronounced redshift or Doppler shift in their light towards the red end of the spectrum. And what Hubble did is he cataloged a whole bunch of these galaxies and these patterns, and he made a graph. And this graph, the top graph, is a graph of uh, some of the original data that he did. What you have here is you have on the horizontal axis distance uh, that's in a unit called megaparsecs, which translate into millions of light years. Um, on the vertical axis is the velocity. And you see that there's kind of a rough upward trend to the data. Now, this is pretty rough. That was like from some of Hubble's original data back in like 1929 or 1930. As time went on and technology got better, we can make measurements of galaxies further and further away to better and better precision. And this, this is a more recent graph right here. And you can see a, a very obvious linear pattern to the data. Now, the thing that's neat about this is this is empirical evidence for exactly the thing that Einstein's calculations show. Einstein's calculations show that the universe is in a state of expansion, right? This is empirical evidence for that. The further and further away things are, the faster and faster they're moving. Just like, let me go back here, oops, just like the dots on the surface of this balloon. Okay? Now, it ends up that 
based upon these data, you can do some big rough calculations and you can kind of extrapolate backwards, right? If the universe, has, as time goes forward, if the universe is in a state of continuing expansion, then it stands to reason that if you sort of wind the clock backwards, then the universe is in a state of contraction. And if you wind the clock backwards all the way to this point right here, if you, wind, if you wind it back all the way to this point right here, what you get is you can get a calculation for the amount of time the universe has been expanding. And that time comes out, according to our best measurements right now, to roughly 14 billion years or so. Okay? Yep. As we extrapolate backward um, with general relativity, are we maintaining the cosmological principle at each stage of the extrapolation? Or is there some point where the cosmological principle might break down itself? Um, the cosmological principle uh, that he's talking about, that's that idea of no matter what dot you're on, you look around and you kind of see everything moving away from you. Uh, as far as I know, no matter how far back you extrapolate, there's no violation of that. But that's as far as I know. I am not an, I'm not an astronomer, a uh, professional like research astronomer, so I can't say that for sure, nor am I a general relativist. Um, but uh, to my knowledge, I don't know of any reason why that would be violated. Now, uh, eventually, of course, you get back to a point where you're talking about very, very recently after the Big Bang, you're dealing with quantum effects, and then that would be a problem. But I'll get into that later, too. Okay. This is what happens when you get more than one physicist in a room at the same time. <laughs> but isn't the Earth moving, too? Yes, actually, um, if you take into account, if you look and you'll notice that there's actually a couple of dots here for galaxies that are actually beneath the zero, they have negative velocity, those are local velocity effects. Okay. Um, if, you, if you take into account those localized velocity effects, then it cleans up the data even more. And when they do this, they take into account the motion of the Earth around the Sun, the motion of the Sun around the galaxy, and all of that stuff. Yeah, they, they take all of those factors into account before they plot these data. Okay, let me point out another misconception about the Big Bang. I mentioned the first one where uh, you have to think about the Big Bang uh, as a, an expansion of space time itself, right? The idea of the the doughy bread with the raisins inside of it, right? And the raisins are not zipping through the bread like little bullets. The bread, the dough of the bread itself is, is expanding and the raisins are carried with it, okay? That's one big misconception about the Big Bang. People think it was like an explosion, right? With this stuff just flying along. The other big misconception is like this. And this is, it's going to be a little bit tough to explain, so I'm going to make use of the ceiling tiles above our heads, okay? Because people say, okay, well, where was this space-time expanding from? Okay? <laughs> My fellow physicist is not his head. He knows where I'm going with this. Where was this space-time expanding from? They say, oh, well, okay, all of this space-time that's our universe was, was focused at some point in the past, right? Well, yes and no. Think of it like this, okay? Just take a look over your heads, right? Look up here, look at these ceiling tiles, okay? And imagine that our universe, our observable universe, is inside this ceiling tile. Okay, just pick a ceiling tile at random, it doesn't matter. Now, imagine that as time goes on, that ceiling tile expands bigger and bigger and bigger, okay? However, there are adjacent ceiling tiles, right? So. At the same time, the adjacent ceiling tiles are also expanding bigger and bigger and bigger. And if you, so if you wind the clock backwards, the way you have to really think about this is that while our observable universe, like this tile right here, while our observable universe very far in the past was a little tiny point like that, the next part of the universe, this tile over here, was also a teeny tiny point, but it was right next to ours. And this tile is a teeny tiny point right next to ours, and so on. And so, when people ask, where did the Big Bang originate? The proper answer, as far as we know from our best theories right now, is everywhere. It was something that happened everywhere in the universe at once. I'm going to pause and see if there's any questions at that point, because that's a real whopper. Okay, that's a tough one. I still have a hard time wrapping my head around that. Yeah? Okay, so 
question I have is, uh, when we start off with the universe, uh, the building blocks would be considered the elements, let's say? No. Um, the elements on the periodic table, you mean? Yes. Those elements, the vast majority of those elements did not exist right immediately after the Big Bang. As a matter of fact, no elements existed right after the Big Bang. It took, uh, it took, I can't remember the exact amount of time, but I'd say it was an order of hundreds of thousands of years for, uh, yeah, 300,000, 300,000, 400,000, uh, for elemental hydrogen and a teeny bit of helium, I think, to form post Big Bang. And it was not until much later when we had the first generation of stars uh, undergo what are called supernova explosions that heavier elements were generated. Okay, so you have this atom that is hydrogen. Okay, now if everything's expanding, does the element itself expand? Does the atom itself expand? Okay, so basically what you're saying is to make an analogy, right, there's a certain amount of distance between you and me, right? If the universe is expanding, are we like getting like I'm this? The center of the is, uh, with, uh, with time. Yeah, okay. the nucleus. Mm -hmm. Now, if everything's expanding, and the, and the component, the relationships of those components, they expand with space time. I would say the answer to that question is theoretically yes, but really, really tiny amount. Because the thing that Hubble was able to discover, and the thing that uh, that Einstein's theories predict, is that the the expansion of the space time, the the amount of expansion you get, is proportional to the size of the objects involved. Right. So that's why when you are looking on these cosmic scales, these millions or billions of light years between galaxies, it's so obvious to see that because you're dealing with such a huge size scale. But when you get down to, say, everyday life like us, or even smaller, you get down to the atomic scale, that is, it, it's a very, it's, it's very, very small effect. All, all galaxies are pretty much the stars themselves. Right, right. But, but, this, but when you, when you're deep, the smaller the size scale is, the less the effect is. And that's why you really only see it in a, in a big way, and in, a, in an obvious way. When you're talking about larger and larger size scales, and you have to get to huge size scales to see this. Now, the point that you're bringing up is interesting for a reason, which will become, which I'll get to later in the talk. Okay, so. Well, yeah. Well, wait, wait until later in the talk, and I'll come back to this particular point because you're you're, you're thinking about something which is very interesting, which I'll touch on at the end, towards the end of the talk. So that's when we start talking about dark energy. So we'll get to that in a little bit. Okay. Uh, let's keep going. Okay, uh, so we've had two lines of evidence so far for the Big, for the big Bang and the uh, expansion of the universe. The predictions by Einstein's general theory of relativity, Hubble's observations of uh, shifting galactic spectra, and so on. This is the third line of evidence. Um, you would expect that if we had a Big Bang to the beginning of the universe, right, it was an incredibly energetic event, uh, that primordial universe was very, very dense. It was very, very hot. Who's checked as a commander? And you would expect that if that was the case, then we should, any one of us should be able to walk outside, look up into the sky, and see it. You know, because if it's really that hot, if it's really that energetic, how come the entire sky is not glowing like an incandescent bulb? Well, the answer is, it is glowing. But it's not glowing in a wavelength of light that we can see directly with our eyes. It ends up that if you have the proper equipment, that is, if you have a microwave detector, you can actually detect the uh, embers, as I like to call them, of the Big Bang. Okay? That's given a special name. It's called the Cosmic Microwave Background Radiation. And this was predicted in the 1950s and 1960s. And the story I'm going to tell you right now is one of the most hilarious stories of falling ass backwards into a Nobel Prize. This is so fun. Some people win the Nobel Prize by, you know, driving really hard research and so on. And sometimes you just get lucky. And that's what happened with these two guys. These gentlemen are named Penzias and Wilson. They were a couple of AT&T Bell Labs engineers. And in 1965, they accidentally discovered the cosmic microwave background radiation. They discovered this, these, these sort of embers of the Big Bang. 
And the way they did it is uh, back in the mid-60s, some of you might remember, uh, some of you might remember the Telsat satellites back in the mid-60s. These were the, these were the satellites that went up for some of the first uh, sort of uh, microwave uh, transmissions and so on to get uh, global network satellites. And uh, these gentlemen were working on this device, which is a big microwave detector. Okay? And what they were doing is they were trying to calibrate this thing. And as they were trying to calibrate it and get it all set up and working for the Telsat system, they noticed that no matter what they did, no matter where they pointed this thing, that there was this persistent sort of background signal, this kind of, you know, kind of in all of their data. It was really annoying. They're like, well, this is throwing off the calibration, so we got to get rid of this. So they tried to see what it was coming from. So they aimed this thing at cities and stuff, and they couldn't. That that wasn't it. Uh, they, they 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 checked all of their electronics. Nothing was out of order there. They checked their calculations. They couldn't find any mistakes there. Now I, I've heard a story about this. I don't know if this story is true, but I also heard a story that they had some pigeons roosting down here in the in the base of this horn, and that it. And it, is it true? Because I've heard this. I don't know if this is true, but the story goes that one of these guys actually got up there with a shotgun one day and killed the pigeons, and they cleaned out the nest and all the poop because they thought maybe that was causing this this signal, right? Well, okay, so a few dead pigeons later and cleaning out all the poop, the signal was still there. And so they were just completely perplexed. They couldn't figure out where the signal was coming from, so they recorded it, and uh, it ends up that uh, at the same time, there was a research group, and I think it was run by George Gamow. It was Gamow's research group. He's a physicist. Say again? A Robert B.K. Oh, yeah, okay. And he was a physicist whose research team was actually planning on trying to detect the cosmic microwave background radiation. That they were actually trying, they were planning on putting together a uh, a, a, a way to detect this stuff because it was predicted theoretically, and then they found out about what Art about Pendius Wilson, <laughs> the lead physicist on the research group. You know, went and told his research group, "We've been scooped by these two guys who just found it by accident," and Pendius and Wilson won the Nobel Prize for that. Um, and. Uh, if you have a microwave detector of sufficient sensitivity, you can actually just you know set it up and aim it up in the sky, and you can detect it on your own. But if you do this very in a very detailed way by taking microwave detectors and sending them above our atmosphere, because our atmosphere actually filters some of the microwaves, if you send those detectors above our atmosphere, you get a map that looks like this. This is an all-sky map, map of the entire sky, of um, a satellite called the Planck satellite. Okay, so it, uh, this, there was actually two missions before the Planck mission. The Planck mission is only a couple of years old. There were two missions before the Planck mission. The first one was called COBE, and that was launched in the early 90s. And that mapped the cosmic microwave background radiation, and it, it didn't do it to a very good resolution. So there was another one called WMAP that went up uh, about a decade or so ago, and it got a more detailed map. And this is the most detailed map that we have right now. This is the cosmic microwave background radiation, these sort of embers of the Big Bang. This is a picture of what our observable universe looked like 300,000 years after the Big Bang. Okay, and there's a little bit, there's a little zoomed in region here to kind of point something out to you. One thing that is noticeable when you start looking at this. First of all, let me explain what you're seeing. The areas that are blue are regions of that primordial universe, 300,000 years after the Big Bang, which are uh, a little bit uh, less dense, a little bit cooler. Okay. The regions which are the red are areas that are a little bit denser, a little bit hotter. Okay. Now. Do you all remember, way back in the beginning of the talk, we talked about that filament type structure where you have galaxies clumping in some areas and then you have the big voids in other areas? We think that what we're seeing is sort of the fingerprints of this from the early universe. That these little regions where you have these dense spots, these are the areas where those filaments are forming and where you get those clumps now. And that these areas where you have less density are the big voids now. Okay? 
more on that in a little bit, because a good question to ask right now is, well, how did all this happen in the first place? I mean, how come it's not nice and smooth? Why do we have this variation? And we think we have a good answer for that. Now, let me just sum up here a little bit, okay? This picture is kind of a, uh, it, I like to call it a cosmic fossil record, so to speak, okay? This is an analogy I make to geology. When you look at geology, uh, geological strata, right, you have the various rock layers, and the further and further down you look, the further and further in, or past, the further and further back in Earth's history you're looking. Um, this is a cosmic fossil record, right? Here, here we are with the Hubble Space Telescope right now, and when you look further back in, back further away, you're looking further back in time, right? So as the Hubble Space Telescope has looked uh, a certain distance away, you know, about a billion light years away, or sorry, uh, you get about to 12 billion light years away, you get the Hubble Deep Field View, right? That's one of those photos I showed you from the very beginning. As you look further and further away, uh, you get other views. You see fewer and fewer galaxies when you look at the earlier and earlier parts of the universe. And this area right here, it's called the radiation era. This is the, this is the cosmic microwave background that we just looked at. There, and according to our calculations, there is a section where we should start seeing the first galaxies and even the first stars forming. Okay? We haven't quite gotten there yet with our technology. Because remember, the further back you look, the harder and harder it is to see these things because you're really far away. Okay? And so our technology's gotten us to about this point, with microwave detectors, we can get this, but we still haven't quite filled in this region yet. We think we know what we're going to see, but we're not really certain yet. We just have to wait until the technology develops so we can fill in that gap in our sort of cosmic fossil record. Yep. Is the technology going to be uh, from space stations where they're not looking through the Earth's atmosphere? Yeah, this is, this is all going to be stuff that's going to be above the Earth's atmosphere, most likely, because the Earth's atmosphere filters a lot of wavelengths of light that we would probably need to see in order to fill out these, these, the, this map. Yep. That's why the Hubble's up there, for example. Okay. So, now, let's talk about this from a different angle. This is really cool. Okay, you all have heard about this thing called the LHC, the Large Hadron Collider. It's the big particle accelerator that got all this press a few years ago when they turned it on in, in Europe, and they, you know, there were some people that thought it was going to kill us all and suck the Earth into a black hole. Um, well, uh... That's a whole other talk I could do, <laughs> and I have done before. But in case anybody wonders, the answer is, is that going to happen? No. no. There's a lot of good physics behind why that's not going to happen, but I digress. That's another talk. But the Large Hadron Collider is the largest particle accelerator that we have on the Earth. It's the largest machine ever built by humans. And this gives you an idea of the scale. This is one of the main detectors in this particle accelerator that basically takes these subatomic particles we call protons and zips them around this humongous ring. I can't remember the exact number, but I think the ring is about 17 miles around. Okay, this thing's about four times the size of the Tabatron accelerator at Fermilab, at Fermilab down the road. And it smashes these things together. When you smash these particles together at very, very high velocities, um, all kinds of interesting stuff comes out of these particle collisions. That's why these things are called atom smashers. And this is one of the detectors, and to give you an idea of scale, that is a person. Okay? These are huge machines, and they have to be so large because it takes a huge amount of energy to cram these particles together and to cause them to basically blow up and, and develop all kinds of interesting physics. Now, the reason why I titled this slide The Big Bang in the Lab is this. There's a lot of physicists who think that we may actually, in a few years, using the LHC, we may actually be able to recreate the conditions of the Big Bang in controlled laboratory conditions. Here's the thinking. Remember, when we talked about the Big Bang, you know, kicking things off about 14 billion years ago, the universe, the early primordial universe, was very, very dense. It was very, very hot, right? Physicists will sometimes call this a quark gluon plasma. Okay? If you don't know what that is, don't worry. I'm going to make a nod from my colleague in the back, so I know I'm on the right track. One of the things that this machine can do when it smashes these particles together is it can generate a quark gluon plasma. 
And so the idea is, if we can get the experiments set up just right, we might actually be able to slam these particles together, and we might actually be able to, for a very short amount of time, in a very small volume of space, create a situation which is very, very similar to the very early universe right after the Big Bang kicked things off. And by being able to create that in the lab and study it, we can push back our knowledge of what's going on with the what was going on with the Big Bang past that you know sort of barrier of the three hundred thousand years afterwards with the cosmic background radiation. Okay, so a lot of interesting physics coming up in the next few years, hopefully from the Large Hadron Collider. Now. Let's get to that question. Just one quick oh, comment there. Quick comment. I think you want to be able to test the cosmological principle in that region. It's yeah, that actually, region that's down. that's where I'm getting with this. Yeah. Uh, to this point about the cosmological principle, remember, this is the idea, right? You've got the balloon, you're on a dot, you look around, you see every other dot moving away from you, and vice versa. Okay. The reason why I said earlier that we get to a point where we think that that might break down, not sure, but maybe, is because, well, you remember the filament structure that we talked about, right? And you remember looking at the cosmic microwave background picture, and you got these areas where it's less dense and more dense and stuff, and then we ask the question, where does all that come from? Okay? Here's the idea. Remember the idea of stretch space-time, the stretch rubber sheet, right? If you imagine that you have this uh, think of it a little bit differently. Think about it's the surface of the ocean, okay? And you're really, really high above the ocean, right? So your, your space-time is represented by the surface of the ocean. And if it's really high, if you're really high above it, you look and it looks all flat. Now you start to zoom in, and you get closer and closer. And the closer and closer you get to the surface of the ocean, this is our space-time, you start to notice little waves, little ripples, right? And then if you get really close, you'll notice that these waves start producing kind of frothy foam. You see, the thing is, when we talk about our observable universe being this primordial tiny point so far in the past, you get to a point where it's, we're not sure exactly how to describe the physics because you not only have to use general relativity because it's gravitation, but you also have to talk about another branch of physics called quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics is the physics of the really, really small. We're talking atomic and subatomic size scales here. And the problem is, when you get down to the quantum scale, this space-time is not flat and smooth. It gets frothy, right? You get like these little bubbles and froths and whatnot, like being close to the surface of the ocean and watching the water get all frothy and bubbly. And the idea is that we think that back when the universe got kicked off from the Big Bang, because it was so tiny, you had all these quantum fluctuations, these little frothy bubbles. And that when we started from this, and it started to expand, that's where this variation came from. Because if you know anything about quantum physics, you know that quantum physics is inherently random in nature. Right? And so you'll get little divots and 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 pufferings of space-time at this quantum scale that could lead 300,000 years after the Big Bang to fluctuations like this, which eventually lead to fluctuations like this. Now, the thing about the cosmological principle, don't really know if that applies on this scale because our problem is we don't have we don't have the, the theory that can take the, the, the mathematics of general relativity and quantum mechanics and put them together. That's why this is so important because we think that by running those experiments we can finally solve that mystery. Okay? And I want to show you this. This is really slick. And then we'll get to the very last part of the talk. If you take all of this stuff that we talked about and you put it into a computer simulation and you run a movie, this is a movie of what we think, of how we think our observable universe evolved over the last 14 billion years, right? You know, from, from those beginning quantum frothiness to forming the filament and void structures. And I'm just gonna I'm just gonna run it here and let you watch it because it's really neat looking. Right? 
right? This is a computer model based upon our best knowledge of physics and cosmology right now. The Z here, that, that stands for something called redshift. It's basically a rough way of marking time. When Z is equal to zero, it's modern time, basically. So I'll show that one more time. Is that counting back in time? Yeah. Oh, no, this is going forward in time. Going forward. The, the beginning is towards the, is the very beginning. It's going forward in time, this video. Good question over there. Okay, when you show the balloon, to me, that's a two-dimensional surface that you're dealing with. Correct. You're showing a three-dimensional, and then yes. changing the time. Right. So you got too many parameters that don't... Yeah, well, the balloon is just a model. Okay, the balloon is just a model to get the idea across. Yeah, okay, but you got something expanding when right. if you had like a circle, I mean a sphere, mm -hmm. not a flat surface, but right. everything in the sphere expanding. Now, are you saying the things in the sphere or the things on the surface of the sphere? No, I'm talking about in the sphere. Right. Like okay, yeah so, what, what, yeah, so the problem is, is that with the balloon analogy, and this is why the balloon analogy is a little bit problematic, you have to think of the universe as the surface of the balloon. And you're, and you're right, that's a, that's a flat two-dimensional surface if you get small enough. And in that sense, it's an incomplete model, but we just kind of use that as a rough idea to get you thinking about some of those ideas. Correct. Oh yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. There's a lot of stuff going on here. This, this is this is pretty mind-bending stuff, and I've studied this stuff for many, many years, and I teach about it. But it's still even hard for me to grasp. So I understand any confusion that you have. It's not confusing me. I'm understanding. Okay. Quick question here. It's it's actually it's not space it's space time it's both together they're 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 the same thing. Mm, no, I wouldn't say that. Um, but let, let, the next few slides will probably help address that question. Okay, so let's let let's. Uh, do we? Is a question or a quick point yeah, of clarification? Well, I want to know within the context of your presentation, where do the uh, super strength theories fit in? Uh, I'll get to that in a little bit. Okay. Okay. Get to that in a little bit. All right. Now let's get to some interesting mysteries that are current. Okay. Everything I've been telling you up until this point, this is this is sort of past physics and cosmology that we've been studying and that we're pretty sure about. Now we start getting to some of the really good stuff, some of the, the new stuff that's come up in the last 15 or 20 years that we don't necessarily have all the answers to, and we're asking a lot of interesting questions, and that also plays into this all this stuff I'm talking about. Um, raise your hand if you have heard about anything, any of these things. Have you heard about dark matter? Yeah. Ever, ever heard of dark matter? Okay. Ever heard of dark energy? Okay. How many of you think those things are the same? Good, because <laughs> they're not. <laughs> they both have the word dark in them, but that's about where the that's about where the similarity ends. I'm going to talk about dark matter first, then I'm going to talk about dark energy, and then we're going to get into some interesting speculation about multiverse or multiple universes, and then we'll do Q and A. Um, it ends up that if you take a look at what are called galactic rotation curves, right? If you talk about galaxies like spiral galaxies like the, the Milky Way galaxy and the Andromeda galaxy. They, they spin, they rotate. And it ends up that, um, based upon the laws of physics that we know, you would expect, when you look further and further out in the spinning disk of one of these galaxies, you would expect the rotational velocity to drop off. Otherwise, the galaxy would fly apart. Right? It's like having uh, mud on the edge of a bicycle wheel. If you spin it too quick, the mud flies out. Okay? But what we actually see when we look at all of these different galaxies is we see that the outer parts of the galaxies are spinning faster than we would expect them to, yet they're not flying apart. And the only way that we can reconcile this without um, you know, overturning all of our laws of physics in a very ad hoc and non-consistent non manner uh, is to say, well, there must be some more matter there which is exerting gravity. 
to hold the galaxy together. And we give that name dark matter. The reason why it's called dark matter is because this is a kind of matter, as far as we know, that does not interact with light. It doesn't give off light. It doesn't absorb light. It doesn't interact with light at all. So we can't see it, hence the term dark. But we infer its existence by looking at gravitational effects, such as this. There are also other gravitational effects, and unfortunately I don't have a slide to show you this, but there's this effect called gravitational lensing, which is predicted by Einstein's theory of relativity, where, um, you know, it's, that's the idea of your bending light. We have lots of examples of dark matter causing gravitational lensing of light. Okay, and if you want to, you just go on the internet and type in a Google search and you'll see these pictures. They're really phenomenal. And so we have multiple lines of evidence that suggest that there's this invisible dark matter out there that we can detect by its gravitational footprint. And it ends up that if you kind of model that and you kind of account for all of that in terms of a picture, you can get a rough map of what it looks like. What we think is going on is that for every galaxy, there's like this big halo of dark matter that surrounds it. And it looks something like this if you model it in a computer projection. Each one of these bright dots is an individual galaxy. And these kind of cloudy purplish blobs are what we think is the dark matter. And we think that based upon our calculations, that this stuff whatever it is that we call dark matter, forms approximately three quarters of the matter in the universe. So actually, the matter that we are used to interacting with, right, the, this tabletop, the, the, the mug of Diet Coke, which I need to take a drink of. Nice segue. Us. <laughs> that this is the minority of matter in the universe based upon these calculations. And um, there are actually, believe it or not, there are actually uh, active research groups which are trying to directly detect dark matter. Because the thinking is, okay, this stuff is out there, it's all over the place, we can't see it, we know it interacts gravitationally, and there are a lot of physicists who are running uh, experiments right now, some of them over at Fermilab, uh, the, the Minos detector is working on this for one, and they have other detectors that are actually trying to detect dark matter particles. And I for one very interested in that because I really like the idea. I mean, the idea of dark matter is very interesting. There's a lot of there's a lot of evidence that points in that direction. But personally, I'm not going to be a hundred percent satisfied with the dark matter explanation until we can actually detect this stuff in a detector. And that's being worked on right now. Um, so this is kind of still an open question to a certain degree. Now, there's an even stranger thing, and that's what it's called dark energy. And that comes to this light. Um, this is a picture of a galaxy with this bright star which is exploding. That's called a supernova explosion. And uh, it was mentioned during the announcements at the beginning that there was a there was a pair of Nobel prizes awarded this year to a pair of American physicists. And that Nobel prize was for the discovery. I'm getting ready to outline for you. This is very recent. Back in 1998, okay, only about uh, 13 years ago. Back in 19, I remember I was in graduate school when this happened. And I was extremely excited to find this out. In 1998, there were these uh, astronomers that were cataloging and, and, and researching supernova explosions of stars all over the place, and they noticed something very interesting. They noticed that. When they were looking at supernova that were a certain distance away, or, yeah, I guess that's, that's what you can, where they thought with the supernova were a certain distance away, I should say that. They thought these supernova were a certain distance away, but they ended up actually being off a bit. Because one of the things that's interesting about supernovas, depending upon the type of supernova, they act like what's called a standard candle. It's like if you take a 100 watt light bulb and you know the light bulb is 100 watts and you look at it and it looks dim, you can infer how far away it is, right? A specific kind of supernova of the class that they were analyzing behave like those light bulbs. So you know that they're going to be a certain maximum brightness 
but depending on how far away they are, you can tell what their distance is and because of the light being brighter or not as bright. And these inconsistencies in the measurements of the distance to these supernova led to a really amazing conclusion. And it wasn't just one research group that did this, it was two research groups that did it independently on different sides of the planet. They weren't communicating with each other. They both kind of fell into this discovery at the same time. And the conclusion, after incorporating all these data, is this. That the universe is expanding, but unlike what a lot of people thought, they thought at the time, up until 1998, the astronomical and physical physics community thought that the universal expansion would probably be slowing down, right? Because of gravitational effects, everything inside the universe is pulling with gravity, you're going to slow it down, kind of like when you throw something up in the, sky, up in the air like that, it slows down because gravity pulls on it. These data suggest exactly the opposite. They suggest that the universe, is at, the expansion of the universe is actually accelerating. It's speeding up. So this would be equivalent to tossing something in the air and watching it speed up this way. And the idea of, you know, where's that, where's that coming from? Whatever is causing that, that is called dark energy. And if you ask me what dark energy is, I'm going to give you the answer that any physicist or cosmologist or astronomer worth their salt will tell you. We have no idea. We have absolutely no idea what this is. All we know is there is something out there permeating the universe, which is causing the expansion of the universe to increase. Now, let me tie this back to something I mentioned really early in the talk. Do you remember we went way back, we go way back, we talked about Einstein adjusting his calculations and putting in the cosmological constant, right? That adjustment is the same idea as this. As, and for that reason, there's actually a lot of physicists who refer to this, not, they don't call it dark energy, right? That's kind of the colloquial name for it, the, the common name for it. But a lot of scientists will refer to this as the cosmological constant. Okay. But we have no idea what this is. This is, even, this is an even bigger mystery than dark matter. At least with dark matter, we have some kind of, you know, rough guess of what it might be, and we've got experiments running that might try to detect it and figure out what particles it is or whatever. With dark energy, no clue whatsoever, complete mystery. As I like to tell my students, WTF, what the physics? We just don't know. Okay? It's, it's physics joke. Yeah. Physics is fun with a pH, right? Okay. Um, now, if we incorporate the idea of dark energy, this is going to come back to a point that you made earlier. Okay, so we're coming, we're coming back around to what you were talking about with the atoms in a minute. Okay, if you incorporate this idea of dark energy, here's basically what we think's been going on. Okay, we've had these two competing forces over the evolution of the universe: gravity and dark energy. Gravity is an attractive force that tries to pull things together. Dark energy is an expansive force that tries to drive things apart. And we think that what happened is this. We think that this dark energy stuff, whatever the hell this stuff is, we think this dark energy stuff has been kind of always there. And, but, at one, but way in the past, gravity was dominant. Because gravity, the closer things are, it's a stronger force. Right? So when the universe was, for lack of a better phrase, relatively confined, okay, Gravitational forces were strong, and so as the universe was expanding earlier, it was slowing. The expansion was slowing down because of the close proximity. Gravity was stronger than dark energy. But then we reached a tipping point where once the universe and space-time stretched out and expanded enough, gravity got weaker, and dark energy was ever present and kept pushing things outwards more and more. And once gravity got weak enough, then dark energy took over, and now we are in a state of accelerating expansion. And as far as we know right now, we don't see any reason right now to think that the universe is not going to continue expanding at an accelerating rate. Now this has some really interesting implications. Let's come back to your point about the atoms. Okay. Well, let me, let me do that one first. Okay. 
Well, and we may save the question for a little bit because we still got an even more bunch of crazy to talk about after this. If you extrapolate this to the logical conclusion, the idea that there's this dark energy all over the universe that's causing things to expand at a greater and greater rate. You remember what I said before, the reason why we don't see this effect of the expansion with atoms is because the size scale is really small. The bigger and bigger the scale, you know, on cosmic scales, it's obvious. If you expand, if you, sorry, if you extract these ideas with dark energy to the logical conclusion and you think that everything's going to keep expanding faster and faster and faster, then eventually you can get to a point where galaxies start ripping themselves apart. And then you can get to a point where solar systems can start ripping themselves apart. And then you can get to a point where planets and even atoms can start ripping themselves apart. And that's given, that's given a name, for lack of a better, you know, sometimes scientists aren't very creative with their names, that, that's kind of referred to as the Big Rip. Uh. Okay, you know, that's, that's, now, we don't necessarily know for sure that that's going to happen, right? We're just, you got to remember, we're working on the best data that we have right now. And I'll, and I'll add a point of caution here. Before 1998, more than 13 years ago, almost every physicist and cosmologist that you talked to said, oh yeah, this is what's going on. They're just going to keep slowing down. After we made this discovery about the dark energy, now we had to adjust our model, right? That's what science does. When you have updated data, you update your models and ideas. We don't really know what's going to happen in the future. We may find something else. We have no clue. That's one of the reasons science is so neat. Okay. Now, let me show you one more thing. You remember before I said, as far as we know, based on our calculations, dark energy is, sorry, dark matter, I call this, dark matter is about three quarters of the matter in the universe. Well, now let's incorporate dark energy. If you do that, and you start taking a look at the energy content of the observable universe, you get a pie chart that looks like this. Everything that we are used to dealing with, everything that we would call the quote-unquote normal universe that we are used to, fits in these two little silver and gold slivers right here. That stuff, that's dark matter kind of think maybe we might have a little bit of a handle on that. The other, we have no clue what that is. We don't know what most of the universe is. We have a little bit of an idea of maybe what this is. We have a good handle on this part. Before 1998, it was just this. It was this section. After 1998, it's all this. We have a lot to learn. <laughs> and there's a lot of people that are trying to figure out what the heck is going on. Who knows what the future holds? There's more, the, this is one of the great things about science. The more, the more answers you get, that it generates even more questions. Now, speaking of generating interesting questions, this brings me to the final part of my talk. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, because this is mostly just kind of, some of this is just kind of goofy speculation. Oh, first of all, what's going to happen in the future? I mentioned the idea of the big rip. Um, if there were, if gravity was dominating, we would get what we think would be a big crunch, right? Gravity would eventually slow down the expansion, everything would collapse. We used to think that's probably what was going to happen. Um, if we had a perfect balance, so to speak, say between gravity and this dark energy stuff, we'd get kind of like this slow, this slow, steady, indefinite expansion. Um, but if dark energy is dominant, which we think is what's going on right now, you eventually get the big rip. But, like I said, who knows what we're going to discover as we keep looking for things. Now let's talk about multiple universes. <clears throat> okay. Um, this is where it gets kind of interesting, in my opinion. Or it can be much more interesting. Now, let me first say that if you want to read about this idea of multiple universes, i got a couple of references for you, okay? You can take a, take a look at a couple of articles from Scientific American. The first article is titled Parallel Universes. It's written by a gentleman named Max Tegmark, and you can come up here and write down the info if you want to look at this. This is an article that was written in Scientific American back, I believe it was in April of 2003. Let me check here. 
Sorry, May of 2003. And in this paper, Max Tagmark outlines that, to a certain degree at least, the idea of a parallel or a multiple universe, while at first it sounds nutty, to a certain degree it's actually not that crazy of an idea. And let me explain to you, um, oh, I'm sorry, there's another article about in a more recent article, a more recent issue of Science of America from August of this year, it's called Questions About the Multiverse. So you can take a look at that too. Now, in order to understand why this is actually, this can be thought of as, as not a nutty, insane idea, it's this. You remember we talked earlier about the idea of the observable universe, right? We can only, we've only seen a certain part of our universe up until this point in time. And we, we, we think, we assume that there's stuff beyond that cosmic horizon where we give time for the light to get to us, we can see it. So, this is what's called a level one multiverse, okay? Level one multiverse is there's our universe and there's just much more to it that we haven't seen yet. So the idea would be like, this is our observable universe, the stuff we've seen up until this point, and if we wait longer, we'll see other stuff. This little green bubble right here with our observable universe in it, this is a level one multiverse. That's the idea. Most cosmologists that you talk to, if you talk to them, think that this is a perfectly plausible idea. There's nothing wrong with this, okay? I count myself in that group. I, I see no logical reason to deny that this is very likely. Now, a level two multiverse is where things get a little bit more interesting. The rest of this picture is the idea of a level two multiverse. Go back to that idea of the frothy space-time at the quantum level, right, with all the little bubbles and stuff, and imagine that one of these little bubbles a little bubble bubbling up, and imagine that it peels off, and then that little bubble universe expands on its own, and then maybe you can get another little bubble universe going boom, peeling off and expanding on its own. That's the idea of a level two multiverse. That bubbling froth is sometimes referred to as a vacuum state. Okay, and these universes in a level two multiverse would be those little bubbles. Our, our universe is one of those little bubbles peeling off and expanding, and there's another universe over here that peels off and expands, and another universe over here that peels off and expands. And as far as we know, these universes don't interact. Okay, so now we're kind of getting into questionable statements about whether or not this is science anymore. Because <laughs> if we're talking about saying, well, we don't know if these things interact, then you know, is that science or is that philosophy? So now we're kind of getting to a little bit of a gray zone. Okay? Here's another way to think of a level two multiverse. Uh, you, you, you get like these bubble universes peeling off of each other as they evolve. Okay? That's another idea. Even stranger is the concept of a level three multiverse. And I'm going to, before I show you the next slide, I'm going to sum it up by thinking, by, by kind of saying it this way. Anything that can happen that's, an, that's consistent with the laws of physics. Oh, by the way, I, I forgot to mention, speaking of laws of physics, oh, um, the laws of physics in a level two multiverse, like this universe over here, not necessarily the same laws of physics in our universe. Okay. Depends upon the initial conditions of that little bubble peeling off. Um, level three multiverse, anything that can happen will happen as long as it doesn't violate the laws of physics. So suppose, th th this kind of relates to the idea of quantum mechanics. Uh, to make an analogy that is more sensible uh, to most people, think about throwing a die. And the die comes up as a one. So in our universe we say, oh, the die came up as a one. The die could have just as easily come up as a three or a four or two or whatever. The idea of a level three multiverse is there are these parallel universes where that indeed did happen. There's one universe where it became a one, there's another universe where it became a two, there's another universe where it became a three, and so on. So that one event, rolling a six-sided die, leads to six universes. Now, before you completely dismiss this idea as complete crap pottery, which the first time I heard it, I thought it was, 
it ends up that according to the laws of quantum mechanics that we understand, this idea is actually completely consistent with quantum physics. Now, that doesn't prove that this idea is right. All it says is that this idea of a level 3 multiverse, this is also known as the many worlds interpretation of quantum physics, that this is completely consistent with how we understand quantum physics. Freaky. And then if you go to the idea of a level 4 multiverse, you start getting crazy crap like this. So that's a little something being humorous, just to throw that at you and mess with you a little bit. The, I, I apologize to any Star Trek fans I may have offended, uh, but I just I got a hold of this actually an hour before I came down here and I said I got to throw that in my talk. That's so funny. Um, actually, the idea of a level four multiverse is just uh, you know it's really it's really out there. It's it's kind of like uh, it, it, in my opinion it's pure philosophy. It's it's like it's basically talk, getting back to you know Plato's idea of the forms and Platonic models and all this mathematics kind of stuff. I think this is funnier. Um, and we don't know what's going on with really any of that stuff. I mean, the, the level one multiverse is pretty plausible. Level two multiverse mm, has some theoretical validity to it, but we don't know if we're ever actually able to test it. Level three multiverse probably never be able to test it out, but it's consistent with quantum physics. Level four multiverse, <clears throat> or whatever, you know, who knows. And so with that, I will conclude with my last one. In keeping with the title of my talk, Life, the Universe, and Everything. And so hopefully a little something there for those of you to get the Douglas Adams reference. And that's it. So I guess we're going to do some Q&A now. Uh, how, do we, how do we do this? Do I need uh, Ken Mike Bram, or do I just... Bram, 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 Bram. I, read a, I read a book on gravity once. Okay. I couldn't put it down. I want to ask you about the uncertainty principle. Uh, the, they have this light in this box, two slots, and one light, I mean one slot has a quantum object in it, and if you shine light on it, the one you want to understand, it interferes with the uh, measuring of the velocity of the quantum object. Now, I heard on the radio, but I didn't hear the whole thing, that you can measure this outside of the box and get and get an accurate uh, measure. Is that true or not? There's a few different ways to interpret that in terms of quantum physics. Uh, talking about the, the two splits, okay. Because in one interpretation, which is called the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum physics, um, the particle that's hitting the slits is like a wave. And in that interpretation, the particle that hits the slits actually interferes with itself. So we can understand wave mechanics, we can understand how waves can interfere. And that causes this striped diffraction pattern, like what you heard about in the That's the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum physics, uh, very loosely speaking. Um, the many worlds interpretation basically says that in one universe you've got the particle going through one slit and the other universe is going through another slit and, and, and so on. Um, as far as the uncertainty principle goes, the uncertainty principle kind of plays into it, kind of think of it this way in terms of the slit experiment. If you have a, the slit has to be very thin, very tiny, right? So what, what the uncertainty principle basically says is that you cannot know the position of a particle and its momentum both to infinite precision. You can know one very well, you can know the other very well, but you can't know both very well. And so if you think about it like this, you got this really thin slit, you fire this particle at it, you know the particle hits the slit, so you know its position within a certain range pretty well. Which means, by the uncertainty principle, you can't know its momentum very well. And that's why it spreads out on the other side. Because, depending upon its momentum, it can go one way or the other. That's the quick and dirty 
explanation. <laughs> I hope that's adequate. Uh, somebody else? Here, let me. It's, it's okay. I can be loud enough. Oh, okay. Tell us briefly. You know, you mentioned that the Hadron Collider was the largest machine that's ever been built. And I, even though this physics stuff's all interesting and it's, it promotes some good research and advances education, what possible benefit is it bringing to guys like me, you know, in terms of research and products? Can you just break down some of the I'll give Ideas. you one example that I'm sure we can all agree has had a profound effect upon society. Have you ever heard of something called the World Wide Web? <laughs> yes. The World Wide Web was invented at the research institution where the Large Hadron Collider is back in 1987. Um, the, reason, the reason why the World Wide Web was invented there was because since that research institution is so big, these physicists got tired of like trying to get information back and forth to each other, so they wanted to have a nice, visual, easily navigable way of doing that. So they invented this thing called hypertext markup language, HTML. That's where the World Wide Web came from. Now, that was not written into the charter of this research institution. It wasn't written down. It's like, okay, you are going to invent this. It was just something that came out as a result that these people kind of noodling around with it, and then it once the basic idea got generated there, some university said, hey, that's a cool idea, and so they started doing it, and then some businesses said, hey, that's a cool idea, and they started doing it, and next thing you know, you know, you get everything from LOL cats to, you know, funny pictures like this, and every and business commerce, the whole bit. It's like Buck Rogers. That, uh, that's a perfect example of the kind of uh, pragmatic, applicable, applicable technologies that can be generated from basic research without necessarily knowing what you want to get in the first place. So that's one of the big arguments I use for investing in basic research. You never know what you're going to get. No, no. As a follow-up, how is this going to help the Cubs? <laughs> you know, I, I hope I hope nobody shoots me here. I don't know if anything can help the Cubs. <laughs> Not even dark matter. <laughs> What percent of, uh, of our galaxy or other galaxies is planets compared to suns? And do these galaxies have similar makeups of ratios of suns or stars, I mean, to planets? We think, uh, broadly speaking, the answer is yes. Um, and we think that the vast majority of the matter in galaxies such as our own and the ones we've seen is in the form of stars. However, some recent research suggests that there are actually maybe many more planets in galaxies than we thought previously. And even more interestingly, these are not necessarily planets that are traveling around stars. They're called rogue planets. We actually think, based upon some recent research, that they're actually rogue planets. These are planets that are like, they're not going around stars, they're, they're like floating around in inter interstellar space. There's actually a lot more of them than we used to think. Now, there are some people who argue that maybe that's what dark matter is, okay? But according to what we know and the calculations that we've done, that, it, that might account for some of dark matter, but it doesn't account for enough. You understand what I'm saying? And, and so one of the arguments going on right now is that maybe dark matter isn't necessarily one thing. Maybe it's different things that we haven't fully understood yet. So maybe some of that dark matter is like rogue planets. Because they're, they're not around stars, so they don't give off light. So, right? so there's actually more stars than, than planets in a, in a galaxy. No, no, no. no. Uh, I'm saying that there's more, the more of the mass is in the stars. Oh, more not, mass. Not, not numerically, but there's more. Because so how many, how many stars are big. <laughs> how, many, how many planets are there typically per star? Oh, gosh. Um, I'll, the, only, the best way I'll say that is uh, we're finding more and more every day. <laughs> Uh, in the last 15 years, we've discovered uh, like over a thousand what are called exoplanets. These are planets that orbit stars besides our own. Uh, and we're finding more of them every day, and they're a lot more common than we used to think. So that's the best answer I can give on that one. Uh, I'm wondering if, uh, first of all, I have a couple of questions. I'm wondering if there's a certain symmetry between the Big Bang and the Big Rip, rip in the sense that at the Big Bang we believe that general relativity and quantum mechanics have to be juxtaposed. Well, the question is, what are people saying about this Big Rip? 
whether we do we have to juxtapose those two great structures in that region as well. And in, in that sense, would there be a symmetry between the uh, end of the universe and its beginning in terms of the uh, propensity to bring together these two great structures in modern physics? I'm going to answer that in the most honest manner possible. Your guess is as good as mine. <laughs> I have no clue. I have no idea. It would be interesting to know if there's anybody who's like studying that at a theoretical level. Maybe. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe they're... If I put out my hand as a chair, what should we tell the students to think about in terms of uh, our ordinary matter in this new world of dark energy and dark matter? Uh, I think the chemists are still going to be okay talking about standard baryonic matter <laughs> until we get a better handle on this dark matter stuff. So they're not, they're, there's no need to go changing the chemistry textbook anytime, anytime soon on this one. Uh, but it's going to be a while before I think we get a decent handle on what dark matter actually is. It's going to Charles, be many decades, I think. Were you asking a question? Yeah. All right, okay. Yeah, Matt, what's a planet? <laughs> oh, well, yes, you know, let's see, let's see, Pluto used to be a planet, no, it's not a planet, um, yeah, um, that, you know, the answer to that question is going to depend upon who you're asking, uh, uh, I would say, in broad strokes, that a planet can be considered any object which is large enough with any object that is large enough that its own gravitational field has collapsed it into a roughly spherical shape. Now, if you want to kind of extend that idea in the context of a solar system, an object that has done that and that has a stable orbit around its parent star or stars, and that has swept clear using gravity um, the local space along its orbit. Okay, uh, I believe that that is kind of the standard definition that's being used for what a planet is. What's the planet? Have melted, and it's big enough to have a melted core. That's what I just read about the planet. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know about that. Because I mean, Jupiter doesn't have a molten core as far as we know. Well, we think Jupiter's core is solid. All right, Alex Hayes. Yes. Uh, with regards to uh, Einstein having more or less established the original concept that off. of the limits of the speed of light as the fastest thing that does nothing to move in the physical universe as such. And in that Einstein originally had issues with quantum mechanics. Yes. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering, in light of time, bringing him further research, has quantum mechanics held on to the, all the core dynamics of Einstein's conceptions of the limit of, of the speed of a physical particle in, in space. In addition, the last part I want to go with, since dark matter, since dark matter, has any other theories come about with regards to that same issue, with regards to the, the limits of the speed of light and how it affects the laws of the universe? This is a really good question. Um, you've been reading up on stuff. <laughs> I can tell. This is a, this is a great question. Okay. There is this concept that when you talk about the, 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 the idea of light speed being the speed limit, physicists often refer to this as locality. Okay, uh, The idea being that uh, things can't influence other things unless they are local events. In other words, they have to communicate, they can't communicate with each other any faster than the speed of light. Um, in quantum mechanics, there are some phenomena which appear to violate locality. You may be thinking of quantum entanglement, for example. Okay. Um, there are interpretations of quantum physics which suggest that might be happening, but the general consensus among physicists is that, and this has to do with, um, this has to do with, uh, what's it called, uh, Bell's theorem and, and, and the related effects of quantum entanglement. The, the general consensus is that locality is not necessarily violated under those conditions. Uh, to explain that would require much time, but I might be able to give you some references that you can take a look at to understand that a little bit better. Um, so if you hang out afterwards, maybe I can like get your email address and I can send that to you because it's, it's a very sticky wicket to try to explain that and I don't want to try it here because I don't know if I can do a good job like right now. Um, so
So I guess that's the I guess that's the best answer I get. Now as far as the dark matter question, moving ahead, um, we see I don't see any reason to think that that's necessarily going to cause any violations of locality. Uh, and I don't know if that's really a question that's up for grabs right now. But you know who knows? We still haven't detected this stuff in the lab. So maybe if we detect it in the lab, get it in a bottle, and find out that it does funky stuff, who knows what's going to happen? Yeah, I'm going to throw a couple of things at you. You just mentioned uh, Maxwell of the wine. Yes. You also had um, the way I look at uh, the human body is made up of seventy-five percent of water. Um, the water of the earth is made up of seventy-five percent of water. But you see, a dark matter is made up of seventy-five percent of water. I think that's curious. Um, the uh, spiral itself looks like a Fibonacci. Um, oh, you mean like Nautilus shell? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. And then you describe the. Um, they fail the curve with the energy being for the competition between gravity and dark energy. Right. You you really describe escape velocity of the Earth when you shoot a missile up. It's around eighteen thousand five hundred miles an hour to escape the velocity of Earth and then you can escape. You understand what I'm saying? So it's yeah. a part of. Yeah, so that, the, the, I'll, I'll start with the first one, the last one first. I mean, the, the idea of the escape velocity is kind of an apt analogy, right? Um, except the only difference is if you want to think about, you know, like a rocket launching off the surface of the Earth, in, the, in an analogous manner to what I talked about in my discussion is, you would think about it like this, like the, the, the rocket starts taking off and at first gravity is slowing it down, and then suddenly it gets to a certain point where there's some other mysterious force that's speeding up. Okay, that's not like the rocket, trust me. Um, the, the idea about water and the Nautilus shell, yeah, he got me. Um, and what was the first one you asked? Oh, Max Planck. Oh, Maxwell, Maxwell, Max Planck and uh, James Clark Maxwell. Um, it's interesting that you mentioned James Clark Maxwell because actually James Clark Maxwell formulated in the uh, mid to late 19th century he formulated the theory of classical electricity and magnetism. And out of that grew Einstein's theory. As a matter of fact, um, the, one, the names of one of Einstein's original papers on relativity was on the electrodynamics of moving bodies. So he was actually referencing Maxwell's theory. So a lot of, so he actually relied a lot on what Maxwell did to develop relativity. Uh, I, I'm not sure what formula you're talking about. So. Now, the other, the, the thing about Max Planck is Max Planck, this has an interesting tie into Einstein too. The, uh, Max Planck was, is sometimes referred to as the, quote, father of quantum physics. He, he was the one who started, who sort of generated the theoretical notion of the quantum. Um, and Einstein, ironically, uh, because this gentleman referenced this, Einstein, ironically, uh, he, he won uh, he won the Nobel Prize, not for really, he won the Nobel Prize for using Planck's theory to explain the photoelectric effect and, and other things like that. And the irony here is that, as this gentleman was saying, later in life, Einstein actually rejected where quantum physics was going. Uh, and this, this, is interesting, this is an interesting kind of uh, sociological lesson. You know, a, a lot of people you know, they kind of lionize Einstein, you know, because he's, he's the He's the paragon of the goofy 20th century scientists and all this stuff with the wild hair and whatever. But what a lot of people don't understand is that later in life, he was kind of seen as a sad figure in the physics community because he got stuck trying to work problems without actually looking at quantum physics. And the rest of the physics community kept moving ahead looking at quantum physics. And Einstein had a real kind of philosophical problem at a certain point in quantum physics. You know, Boulder, the common phrase, God does not play dice, right? Because the sort of inherently random nature of quantum physics disturbed him a great deal. He didn't like that. And in, I don't know if this is a real conversation that actually took place, but this is kind of worth kind of throwing it out there, I think. Uh, apparently, depending on the story goes, uh, Einstein was talking to a, a quantum physicist by the name of Niels Bohr. And that's where the idea of the Bohr model and the atom comes from. And Einstein kind of made this quip about God does not play dice, and Niels Bohr responded by saying, Einstein, stop telling God what to do. <laughs> 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 Rose? Yes. 
just for the I, uh, I was rose call. Um, I feel like vaguely something Uh, you mean like, say, the connection between consciousness and quantum mechanics and stuff like that? Um, I would say, based upon uh, best science that we have right now, the consciousness is probably like an immersion phenomenon. That you know, you get enough neurons packed into the same spot, same volume, and you can develop consciousness. Now, I'm not a neurobiologist, so I couldn't really tell you that. But from where I stand, and from where it seems that the research on neurology and whatnot is going, is it seems that consciousness is a physical effect. That, that seems to be where it's heading right now. Uh, if you know, if there are any dualists in the room, they'll probably uh, vehemently argue that point. No, that's fine. Because that's, a, that's still another bit of a gray area that we don't know all the answers to. But we're, we're working for it. All right. And then, oh, uh, this is Edward. Uh, question back here. Uh, 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 yeah, Do you know of any implications or predictions that have been made uh, about what the effect of the discovery of particles and <laughs> faster than light is going to have on science as we know it now? Okay, uh, first of all, let me say that. He, this gentleman is referring to the recent apparent, and I highly stress the word apparent, discovery of uh, superluminal neutrinos. These are neutrinos, you know, you may have heard about in the news, uh, that seemed like they were going faster than light speed. It's not apparent, it's not actually, it's not clear, I will say, that that's actually what's happened. Um, there's a lot of caution in the physics community about reading too much into those results, including from the research group that reported those results. They're, they're also extremely skeptical of their own results. And so what's happening now is there's a lot of effort going on right now in the physics community to try to replicate that phenomenon. Because the, the way that things go in science is when you have something kind of interesting or amazing like that seem to pop up, you want to try to replicate it. And if nobody else can replicate it, then that means that like that one research group is probably screwing something up and they can't figure it out. So it's not immediately obvious that that's actually what's happening. Now, if we want to speculate and assume that is what's happening, as far as the implications of that, I don't know. Um, it would definitely mean we'd have to make some adjustments to our physics theories. Where, that would, where those adjustments would take us, you've got me. Um, because, I mean, we mentioned Max Planck before, right? Max Planck started with this very simple idea of the quantum, and who could have anticipated that 100 years later it would lead to the Internet? Uh, so. Max read, I thought I read that CERN had uh, also attained, obtained uh, uh, the exact same result. Well, no, the, 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 uh, the original result was obtained at CERN and another institution because the, the neutrinos are being fired from CERN through uh, uh, through Europe and the detector was actually in Italy. So um, it was all, yeah, CERN was already involved in the original result. Okay. So, but again, you know, we, we don't, we haven't been able to replicate it yet. We don't really know what's going on. There's a lot of people looking into it. It could be an error. Who knows? We just got to wait and see. I'm sorry, but, you know, it's after 10 o'clock. Okay. Yeah, I get to eat, too. <laughs> okay. All right. We'll, let him, off the we'll let him off the hook. What is the Higgs boson? Speaker in the back. You don't have to be an astrophysicist uh, to uh, make you do it. You better be. Move the podium over. That doesn't make any sense. All right. Uh, well, I'll make a All right. I have, uh, we'll, we'll have a, uh, a six
Six foot max. Oh, wonderful. Six foot oh, okay. max. It's a record. <laughs> okay, what a talk, huh? You know, this world is going nowhere except expanding, especially as the uh, economic uh, more raise in our country is. Here's the latest issue of Fortune magazine. <laughs> This is where uh, corporations stroke themselves for poisoning Americans. The 211 Business Person of the Year, no other than the chairman of the board of the reinvented Starbucks. Yeah, Mr. Schultz, uh, straight out of Nazi Germany. Uh, this guy has figured out a way to poison, and he'd love to poison seven billion people around the world. Because coffee has two substances in it that are extremely poisonous. And because America is what we call uninformed, and we have a legal term called uninformed consent, that's when you're being poisoned by some substance and corporations don't care because of their profits. Okay, There's a couple of substances in coffee that many people are not aware of. First one most people are aware of is called caffeine. And that gets you real jumpy. It gets you hooked on it just like nicotine, caffeine, morphine. You get the connection? These are substances that are very poisonous. There's also a substance in there called tannic acid. Now there's some trees in the deserts of Africa called the acacia tree. And tannic acid is a substance that's in, in these trees that if uh, they grow, they're, first of all, they're very long lived, two, three hundred years old, and the wood is very, very dense. And they're not that large a tree, but they do get pretty dull sometimes if there's water. There's a lot of desert area in Africa. Okay. But when animals come along like giraffes and they start chewing on these trees, they send out a signal to these other trees that something's possibly harming one of their brothers. And this substance can actually kill giraffes. So they tell their young, and they t the giraffes teach their young, just like deer teach their young, that certain Evergreens are not edible. They can actually die from eating them. They love cedar, but they don't eat long needle pine, scotch pine, things like that. And okay. this substance, tannic acid, causes a very sticky substances in the lining of our veins and arteries. Now, everybody knows that we have a spleen and we have marrow. And this is where our new red blood cells are generated. <laughs> when these red blood cells die, they go to the organs around the liver and create a substance called bile that, that can break down foods and, and normalize uh, our digestive tract. That's where this sticky substance belongs. It's called bilirubin. Well, when Tannic acid gets in the veins and arteries. This bilirubin attaches to the veins and arteries, and it occludes them. Okay, causing guess what? Anybody want to take a guess what happens when your veins and arteries start to constrict? Here's a heart attack back here. Stroke. Yes. Number one killer in the United States. Folks, hypertension. Look at coffee cups around here. Okay? These are unsuspecting Americans that are being killed by this goofball right here. Mr. Schultz. Comrade Schultz. You know. Yeah. There he is, right here. Smiling away in his blue jeans, right? But he's got an Armani suit that he throws away every day. He's got 365 suits a day. He wears one, throws it away, or gives it the Salvation Army. Yeah. Number one business person of the year. 
an exterminator. You like these guys? Let's go through the, uh, the hit parade here. Okay? 20% uh. of the 50 uh, top business people in the world, okay, are exterminators. Here's their companies. Okay? I only got a couple. How much time I got left here? 57 seconds, three seconds. Okay. How about uh, Starbucks? We'll start with Starbucks. That's that guy, right? How about Chevron Oil? How about McDonald's as an exterminator? Kraft Foods. They make all those cookies and candies. How about Coca-Cola? You like Coca-Cola? Look at the obesity in this world. Okay, and the Americans, all Americans alone, from San Diego to Vermont, 80,000, 80,000, 80 million. That's almost 30% of our population because of Coca-Cola. But they produce Instant good fat. food. You might as well take a pot of Coca-Cola, pour it right in your panties, ladies, because that's where it's going. Okay, how about Cargill? You like them? How about Dutch Shell? You like $4 gasoline? How about, uh, he, he was a runner-up. He was number, where is it? Uh, where is this guy here? Oh, yeah, Dutch Shell. He was number 15. There's his smiley face. Okay. Okay, and you're Spend another thirty seconds. Go ahead, some you're off. Uh, how about uh, Exxon Mobil, Duke Energy, Nestle, and Petrobras? That's out of Brazil. Thank you, Mr. Wethort. Doc Holiday. Stick around for the rebuttals. Uh, first of all, I want to thank Matt for an outstanding talk on cosmology. I don't think in my life I've ever heard a better talk than the one I have today. I think he really deserves a great uh, It was time I had here. I just wanted to present some issues which have always concerned me somewhat. Uh, one of the things which really concerns me a great deal is the emergence features of dark matter and dark energy. We know a little bit about the emergence of the uh, early elements in the universe, in the expanding universe, Big Bang scenario. As Matt mentioned, uh, trace amounts of helium and hydrogen, and then the higher elements were cooked in supernova explosions. So we know that, uh, and we know that general relativity is important also in this expansion, expanding universe. Uh, paradigm so that it didn't have the universe collapsing on itself before the recovery elements could form. So we do know that general relativity is extremely important in chemical science and I have perhaps been barking on a crusade whenever I can to make general relativity an important part of the chemistry curriculum. I really believe that uh, this is important as quantum mechanics to understand the origin of the chemical elements. And now that we have graphene, where the electrons in graphene is subject of the Nobel Prize for last year, played the role of massless photons, we really know that we have to, uh, in order to explain the technology of this material, we have to use general relativity and quantum mechanics. So the two structures have to be joined. And uh, I just think that uh, one of the great uh, adventures of our lifetime is to try to see what we could do to bring together these two great structures. And uh, I'm not sure string theory is going to do it. I've heard Roger Penrose make some very potent objections to uh, string theory, and I think that he's on to something big, that we're going to have, uh, if you've ever heard of Lee Smolin with his loop quantum gravity, where space-time is itself quantized, I think that's a more, a better way of going, but that remains to be seen. Uh, the, but I am, I'm really concerned, though, about uh, how we understand the emergence features of dark uh, matter and dark energy, when it emerged in the history of the universe, not just its nature, and uh, the, the final thing I'd like to mention is something which is now coming up in terms of chemical technology. Some of you may have heard about this notion of the Casimir force. When you take these two parallel plates in vacuum and there's a attractive force between the two plates. And the notion is that it's the vacuum fluctuations which are partially squeezed out by these plates which are causing them to attract. So now we do a Gadok experiment where the, a thought experiment where the parallel plates are moved far apart to where their separation is the order of the Hubble length. So we ask ourselves, is the Casimir force possibly just a, a local manifestation of the dark energy or the quintessence field? And this is an issue which is being discussed now in uh, 
certain scientific circles, and it's an unresolved issue. I think it's a very intriguing one. But I think one of the things that Matt Point, which was so good about his talk, we have to unify all these disparate notions into a coherent whole. And I don't know if it will happen in my lifetime, but I think it's a great quest. And another thing that I point out, the technologies will come out of it, which will really help move our civilization forward. Hopefully, some more of the renewable energy to mitigate the climate crisis. But uh, I think we have to really support this uh, with all our heart and souls, this, this energy. It's too bad this research. It's too bad we didn't have the uh, superconducting super collider uh, finished in Texas. But I think it's our obligation as Americans to participate in this work at CERN and juxtaposing with what we're still doing in Fermi Lab on the uh, so-called neutrino oscillations, the neutrinos changing different species, and uh, that they do have a finite mass. And this is supposedly a very important aspect of testing some of these constructs as well. This is really an exciting field, and whether we are scientists or engineers or whatever, I think we all have to participate and support this work with every ounce of our being. Our future does depend, I think, on supporting this work and uh, having the feedback from the technology. Let's give that another hand. I don't think I've ever heard a better talk in my life on this subject. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's been unified in the Bible. You've got a sign gun for that. It's all summarized right there. I really enjoyed the speech. It was very interesting, and um, I believe what Einstein believed, that we have to have a unity between uh, quantum physics and macrophysics. And he uh, tried all his life to prove that and to have a unified theory. And there is some evidence that it is unified. For instance, they took uh, two quantum objects and they uh, put them into different areas and different spaces, and they communicated with one another. That shows, essentially, that these quantum objects were part of a, a larger, a, a, a larger uh, type of uh, experiment that was unified. In other words, it was part of a process that came together. It was part of a unified process and it showed unity and it showed that it is possible to do that with, uh, with quantum mechanics. Another thing he brought out about the expanding universe and one day that uh, the expanding universe might expand to a point where it will rip apart and, uh, of course, the uh, theory that you can't uh, destroy energy and matter, which is both the same thing, uh, to me seems like if you destroy whatever it is, the energy and the matter will still be there and will reform itself. And in that way, I think the universe is uh, infinite. There's no end and no real beginning to it. The Big Bang might have started it in one era, but another Big Bang will probably start it in another era. So I think it's, uh, it, you uh, have a type of universe that has no beginning and has no end. And the further we look out into the universe, the more we see. And like he said but about Einstein, at first he thought, that our universe was more or less uh, encompassed in a certain area, and he refused to think of other universes, other galaxies. But then, with the uh, telescopes and everything, they could see with the red shift that there were other uh, galaxies. So I think you, the uh, galaxies are infinite. Well, we get five minutes or six? Ten. I think six. I'd like to thank Matt for a really good presentation tonight. Uh, I found it interesting all the way through, although 
Uh, I'm not real scientifically qualified to comment on several parts of it. I think as most of us in the audience are not physicists, there are a few of us work. But uh, his talk uh, followed on the groundwork laid by a speaker last week that uh, talked about the cosmos, uh, talked about the scientific concept. Uh, our speaker last week said if he hears some new information that's really interesting, if he's not familiar with it, he said, I'll take a look at it. I'll, I'll look at it and study it and see if it makes sense before I'll stand up and say, oh, well, that's a load of bull crap. I, that can't be true. Um, we have a great tradition dating back to, you know, Galileo's time. Galileo is famous for what I call the Galileo curve, the learning curve. Somebody starts out early on. Galileo uh, was threatened with being burned at the stake for his new theory that the Earth was not the center of the universe, or that the Earth actually revolved around the sun. As I understand it, um, the church arrested him, and he was under house arrest, avoid getting executed because he recanted. But scientists came along behind him, just like physicists are coming along behind uh, the early people uh, from the teens, 20s, 30s, Scient the scientific body of knowledge on several different subjects is growing. And at, at a certain point, the body of evidence gets so big that we say, we know and understand this now. We didn't 20 years ago, 30 years ago. Uh, for those of you that may not know me, uh, I give speeches and presentations on blacked out subjects, things for which there is an enormous scientifically solid database that's accepted around the world, but blacked out by the American press. And there have been a series of books published in the last few months talking about how the American public is being maintained in a bubble of ignorance on certain key subjects that would change our country overnight if they were covered rather than blacked out. And um, one of those subjects, of course, right now that's affecting everybody is the, the seven, eight trillion dollars that was given to the banks through the back door while they were making it look like $700 billion was being given to General Motors and things in the bailout. They said if you divided up the amount of money the Federal Reserve uh, gave the banks, it would amount to $24,000 for every person in the country. A family of four would have gotten $96,000 in a bailout in, in 2008. So, um, you know, one of, the, one of the myths, the pieces of mythology that Americans are living under is that if you shovel money to rich people, uh, everybody else's life will improve. Well, we're in the final stages of, of the, the collapse of that theory. Uh, are there, you, I see several African American people in the community here. Do you know anybody, can I have a show of hands among everyone that is familiar with something called the Tuskegee experiment? Yes. Okay, if you're familiar with the Tuskegee experiment, then you, you're familiar with the concept of fraud in the medical community. And um, there's a huge body of knowledge that's showing that there's a new fraud developing in America now uh, that's been on the stepping stones of the Tuskegee experiment and several others. I mentioned it earlier. It made the news about a week ago where our government, uh, they proposed to make it mandatory to test every uh, uh, child under the age of 18 at least once for HIV. Uh, that's because the cat is out of the bag all over the world. They know that the HIV test is totally bogus. The test doesn't test for the HIV virus. Other countries are totally correcting what they're teaching people about what causes AIDS, what, why people died, and how to avoid getting your medical records classified uh, as a pre-existing condition with HIV. The drug companies are giving away a couple hundred thousand free HIV tests that don't test for the virus at all. That's spelled out in the lawsuits. And they stamp medical records HIV positive, and then it's a pre-existing condition where they can charge whatever they want for health care. Now, the, the other thing I would say, I've reached the point where uh, I will uphold the concept of the college where it says one, one fool at a time and we don't insult anybody or their mothers. Um, if I present, 
or anybody else presents a huge body of scientifically proven knowledge, and somebody comes up here and says, well, that's a load of crap. Uh, you know, this is just not right. Um, when I present a body of knowledge that's uh, backed by a bunch of Nobel Prize winners around the world, I will no longer tolerate somebody standing up here and say, that's Andy's bullshit. <laughs> the man, if you got a, if you got a complaint with the evidence, write a letter or phone call or something to the guy that got the Nobel Prize and all his colleagues for publishing it and proving it. Just like the science, uh, we, we won't, won't tolerate somebody standing up here saying, the earth is 6,000 years old. This is all a crock. You know, I just came back from the Creation Museum in Kentucky. Uh, young people were riding young dinosaurs as ponies 6,000 years ago, so all I need to know is what's in the Bible. Well, that kind of ignorance is why hundreds of thousands of Americans are dying every year from various kinds of pharmaceutical-caused illnesses that are not happening in other countries. Other countries are not allowing this to happen. So, uh, there's, you know, pe we need to face the truth on a variety of subjects and help our less informed people uh, become more alert to what's going on. Thank you. All right, well, Matt, thanks once again for a uh, brilliant speech. I really enjoyed it, and I learned, uh, learned a little bit. Uh, I guess I'm just something of an amateur observer of this stuff, having probably been first turned on to cosmology by by watching Cosmos and Carl Sagan, and then uh, and then just kind of you know occasionally uh, just you know reading the you know seeing the articles in the paper, uh, seeing that I saw the film uh, The Sidewalk Astronomer about John Dobson, which by the way I hope he's still alive. I don't know if you know I I should look it up on uh, the internet. Uh, but he, he was in his 80s when that film was made. But he's another guy like Carl Sagan that can sit on the edge of a desk in a classroom and talk about cosmology and some pretty complicated things and put them in layman's terms and uh, let, you know, to get people to understand, you know, lay people to understand the, the topic. And uh, through all that stuff and watching Nova on TV and trying to listen to. Uh, the audio book of uh, a brief history of time. So gradually, some of these things have sunk in. So I know a little bit about cosmology, but that's about it. Uh, but I just, but I really enjoy it. I still always love hearing about this stuff and expanding my my knowledge of it a little bit, even though I don't work with it or anything like that. I'm just a casual observer. Um, so I'm going to sh downshift gears a little bit, though, to something that I do a little know a little more about. about that I've seen it's been a topic on. Facebook and a lot of uh, listservs and stuff on the internet. And that is this new bill that the Senate passed, I think 93 to 7, allowing uh, suspension of habeas corpus and uh, allowing for uh, military people to arrest U.S. citizens and hold them uh, in detention without seeing a lawyer for an indefinite period. Well, I've seen all these uh, liberals on the internet lambasting this and criticizing it. However, uh, I make the point that uh, the Constitution is not a suicide pact. It's, it's been, you know, it is flexible. So in times of war and great crisis, and like right now we are embroiled in a and as a terrorist war, and we, one time we've been in the Civil War, habeas corpus has been suspended many times since, uh, the, since the Constitution. It, it actually, you know, World War II a number of times uh, it, it was, of course, in the Civil War. And uh, the thing is, is uh, you know, here's why this is important now. Because if there is an enemy combatant, and this is this would be a an outlaw combatant, you know, an enemy combatant is like somebody would be wearing a uniform. But if it's a non-uniform person, either a citizen or not, in this country, and they are, you know, uh, part of a terrorist network or something, you do not want to tip off their accomplices that they've been picked up. And the, the time that you can turn a, uh, an enemy combatant into becoming an informant or a double agent, the first 48 hours are critical in doing that. 
So what you want to do is pick these guys up and try to turn them as fast as you can and, and, and before their accomplices know that anything's going on. So, so, well, so that's one. You know, that's that's that alone is a is a good enough reason. But another good reason, another good reason for this, is because you know it's it's a form of pressure. It's almost like you know it's sort of like torture without really being physical torture. Is that when you have that power, when you apprehend somebody, and they know that you have the power to detain them indefinitely without a trial, that puts an incredible amount of force on them to start talking and to cooperate. Now, if, you know, you're whining about waterboarding and all that. Well, you know, this is not a painful thing to them, but it's a, it's a psychological thing, and it helps in our favor. Now we, you know, do we want to win this war on terror or, or not? And if we're going to do, if we do, we need to take off the gloves and have, you know, the full arsenal uh, at our disposal. Anybody that's an enemy combatant or you know, outlaw enemy combatant that is planning on, uh, you know, exploding a bomb in a subway or some other, you know, terrorist act. Uh, that is an attack on the nation, which by definition is an attack on the Constitution. And they therefore give up those rights for protection of the Constitution. You can't, you can't go out to destroy the Constitution, and then when you get picked up, say, Oh, my constitutional rights are being violated, I need a lawyer. No. And the other thing is, we, we, if, you, if you have a trial, if you have habeas corpus, and you have a trial to prove that somebody's a terrorist, now the government's going to have to introduce their evidence, and even though it's, you can do it, uh, you know, somewhat, you know, cloistered secretly, doesn't have to necessarily get the public, but still other people are going to know about it, and this is going to trickle out, or could trickle out, to the enemy, again, to the enemy forces, to the leaders. So we don't, you know, the, if the government reveals what the evidence is that they have against this person. That's going to reveal maybe how they collected the evidence, or who they got it from, or something like that, and endanger that particular operation, or maybe those people, informants, or whatever. We're not going to have trials So this anymore. is a good thing. And you know what? What does the government... The government does not want to put innocent people in jail. No one's going to come and drag you out of your bed at night. It's bad PR to do that, and it's expensive. So they're only going to take people that they have a good, uh, you know, reason for believing oh, they're that are uh, enemy combatants. Deutschland über alles. Deutschland über alles. Arrest him. You know, put me behind a guy like that. I'm glad I'm not from America. He's got his own universe. Yeah, I think it's in your right to say that, but I don't believe nothing you just said. <laughs> He's going to be the first one arrested. Don't worry, we'll get some justice. <laughs> so first of all, Matt, I want to say uh, I really appreciate your talk. I enjoyed it really immensely. I'm trying to get this thing back in here, right? Uh, I myself personally consider myself to be the kind of like scientific kind of guy. You know what I'm saying? But in a strange kind of way, you know, I also consider myself to be ambidextrous because. As illogical as it may sound, you know, I, I believe in physics, I believe in mathematics, I believe in evolutionary biology, I believe in, in evolutionary cosmo cosmology, as we're, we're determining it to be, because we're discovering more about how it is that the universe is formed, and, and what are the preconditions that are giving rise to that which we perceive to be. So we're learning as we're growing as, as, a, as a species. Uh, on this planet as I can discern it. But the most amazing thing about myself that I can discern is that I'm also a theist. You know what I'm saying? And some people will find it very, very difficult to realize it and understand it. So I, I want to try and say I'm ambidextrous. Because on, on my better days, you know, I, I follow my right hand side of my brain and I'm all into physics, I'm all into science, and so I stay abreast of all the latest things to try to leap to the infinite way or the infinite things that I could discern with my mind. And then there are days I wake up and I feel like Paul and I say, oh my God, I'm a fool for Christ. You know? and, and by that I mean this, that part of my brain or that part of my psyche is, is shared by so much of the human family that I pretend or I, I conceive of it almost like where there's smoke, 
Might not there be fire of some sort? As I am discerning physics as it's moving more into the, to the multiverse, as moving more into the, the, the non-locality of physical effects, or meaning communication without touch, you know, moving beyond the idea of, 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 of a space-time continuum being the limiting factor as to that which discerns uh, instantaneous communication. It, it kind of reminds me of something of uh, some, something or somebody or something being omnipresent, you know what I'm saying? And, and, and those kind of words that, that the human mind has kind of like created over its, its, its centuries of existing. You know, in my mind, in my mind personally, you know, when I'm in my better days, my mind soars down those roads of science because I understand the principles upon which it's founded, building upon the backs of one man over another man over time and throwing out what doesn't work, what cannot be observed, what cannot be collaborated. That is a powerful method that will get us to where we need to go. But at the same time, there has been others that have followed different kind of tracks. And they follow the mystical track. Now, between yourself and myself, I would consider myself to be a mystic as well. I mean, I meditate. And I soar off following those same kind of logical, rational uh, thought processes in my mind. And they get me to places and spaces where I have discerned through readings and whatever, where other people have been. So I am re observing what they have observed, the same way scientists observe and collaborate what others observe. Like the universe and everything. It was powerful. It was powerful. Now, oddly enough, and I'll just say this in passing, I myself am here tonight because of that title, as you said, because I myself gave a talk with that same topic. Charles is probably the only one to hear who will remember me because he, he, he wrote a little thing on, the, on what it was like, the universe and everything. He was like, blah, 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 like, uh, turn that down, forget about that, that was the, his joke on the, on the, on the flyer. But I enjoyed your talk because, again, to me, it will get us there. It will get us there. When we keep following and pursuing, and I think that there will be a union and a unity on, the, on man's rational side and his spiritual side. Because I believe that there is an essence at heart and the truth behind man's spiritual leanings that is founded and is grounded in the same laws that underpin our universe. And I think it's only in our natural kind of ways, being ordinary human beings, that we kind of like reach that in our own kind of way. And we feel it. And it, it corresponds to our needs and it satisfies our needs just as our intellectual leanings are satisfied by our search for truth and higher truths. Thank you. Thank you again, Matt. I guess all of us are thanking you, Mac. <laughs> so it comes to me. Uh, the first thought I have is to bless water. Okay? Bless water. And the reason I say that is because most things that you know that are alive compo are composed of water. Now, the, the one thing that I'm getting out of um, the talk is this 75%, this number. Uh, it's glaring out at me because I'm looking at three things. Another thing is fear. The, the thing that is occurring sometimes with people is based on some kind of fear. Fear is a negative emotion, and it's an emotion that changes. Love is a positive emotion, and it's the only emotion that does not change. Once you have love, you always have love. Now, when, when I think of also uh, many topics, it comes down to the pineal gland. There's a special water in the pineal gland. At one point in man's development, <clears throat> the pineal gland was like three centimeters in size. Now it's three millimeters in size. When you pray or meditate on any topic, and the topic that I'm getting at is about the cosmology of man or about space, about anything that you get into. It's about you. It's not about something that's outside of you. And that's where your meaning is. It's about you. And so the, the thing about uh, that preceded, he was talking about uh, meditation. And um, when you meditate and you 
are about the pineal gland, you create an, an energy that blesses everybody. And when you are about love and you're about something that is meaningful. Now, when you go into something as, as far as science is concerned, I was a regional trainer for Dish Network and I was responsible for five states. I can aim satellites into space or the dish of a satellite and hit something I couldn't see. And this was what I was responsible for training people on. So it's important to understand that there's something that you cannot see that you are about. Even though they're talking about CERN and, and uh, these different uh, colliders, they're trying to do something that they cannot see. If you are true to who you are, the nature that you, that you have within yourself, and you come from that point, then you gain more, or you are what you are about. I'm also a master drummer. Okay, I've played most of the clubs in, in um, downtown Chicago. I've gotten paid a thousand dollars more than once to play drums. And I tune myself into what I'm about. Science is very meaningful, but at the same time, you have to know what's happening in the interworld as well as the outer world. And when you get into all these things about, um, let's say, politics and that, okay? I'll leave you with this thought. Check out what is called a pure contract trust. A pure contract trust. All right? Now, what that is is a trust that you set up that nobody can see. It's what the Rockefellers and most of the uh, elite use. They pay no taxes, and it prevents lawyers and attorneys from getting their wealth. There are two types of people. One that works, and one that steals from the one that works. One that robs the one that works. Okay? One that does a raid on the one that works. So, this, this one type of trust, and it's based on, um, I can tell you some other history that's connected with it, but the, the thing is it only costs a dollar for the notary public, and it only costs forty dollars to register it at the uh, recorder of deeds in the county, and it is something that no one can see, and you can put all of your your wealth into it. And that's my talk. Thank you very much, Matt, for your talk. And thank you particularly though, for being a teacher. I just want to give you props for that because I, I know very little about uh, physics. And I can say that I'm leaving here tonight with you know a rough idea of the outlines of it. So you've given me a great general picture of that. And that's incredibly hard to do. So I, I wish I had had a science teacher like you when I was in high school. I probably would have paid more attention. Uh, so thank you very much for that. Uh, in keeping with the tradition of the college, I'm going to talk about something that has absolutely nothing to do with the talk. Very, very, you know, very traditional thing to do. And that is um, the bill referred to um, earlier, uh, Senate Bill 1867. Um, one, one of the things after 9-11 that particularly disturbed me, well, actually two things. One was the increasing militarization of the police. So not the militarization of the military, they stayed pretty much the same, but the militarization of the police. And then also this metaphor of war, which increasingly became expanded. Um, with the militarization of the police, all you have to do is look at the Chicago Police Department and its evolution in the short time that I've been here has been amazing. So going from riding around in squad cars and having just basic handguns to now you see them riding around in these large SUVs, and underneath the floor in the back, they have an M4 carbine, which is the same weapon being used currently by the Marines and the Army over in Iraq and Afghanistan. Why they would need that in Chicago, I have no idea. They have in their uh, grenade launchers, they have multi-unit tear gas guns, the whole deal, you name it. They've got enough material in there that if they wanted to start a small war in Rogers Park, they could, right? Why they need that equipment again, I have no idea. Apparently, we're very threatening. I don't know. Um, getting back to this idea of the metaphor of war, okay, 
There was a point made earlier about how the government's only going to detain the people that deserve it, right? Well, if you look at this particular bill, if you look at Senate 1867, and I just downloaded it a minute ago to my phone, one of the benefits of technology, you can read through it. It's the National Defense Authorization Act. They go through it every year. It's a basic bill to make sure that the Army, Navy, Air Force, etc., gets the money it needs to keep going. Buried towards the back of it, as the Congress usually does, they put all the important information on page 800, so by the time you get there, you're all worn out, is that redefinition of the United States as a battleground. What that allows them to do, as the earlier speaker mentioned, is the Army has the ability, at any point in time, if you are deemed a clear and present danger, a threat to the nation, they can arrest you and detain you indefinitely. Also, and this was not addressed, they have the authority to kill you. And I brought up a couple of weeks earlier the drone strike and how that bothered me, that even though this guy was a terrorist in an Al-Qaeda cell living in Yemen, he's a United States citizen, and he's subject to the rights of U.S. citizenship, regardless of who or what he is. And I felt, based upon a legal interpretation, that he should have been captured and tried. Okay? Uh, a lot of people laughed at me. They're like, oh, you're splitting hairs, yada, yada, yada. The way the common law works is through precedent, and we are very much a common law nation. It sets a dangerous precedent when you start killing United States citizens, okay, regardless of who they are and where they are. And this is another one of those things, because essentially what it does is it revokes the Posse Comitatus Act of 1876, okay, it essentially eliminates that act and takes it out of force. Why was that passed? It was passed in particular because the southern states didn't like the Union Army in the South, okay? So it had a bad motive initially. They didn't like the fact there were blue coats there telling them that they had to allow African Americans to vote, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, the whole deal. But it's had some positive benefits down the line in that whenever presidents wanted to use military force, they had to go through multiple channels, okay? Because there has always been an emergency clause in effect, which they could use. And that is why they were able to bring the 82nd Airborne into Watts during the riots in the 60s. That's why they've been able to use military forces in different areas, because the president declared a state of emergency, which had to be approved. Okay? And these were limited things, which had a beginning and an end date. This act eliminates the beginning and the end date. It makes it possible for the final step of the militarization of the police. Okay? where they are, in fact, the military walking on the street. Now, if, as you know, our earlier speaker asserted, that, that doesn't bother you, that's, that's great. You, know, you can forget about everything I just talked about and go to sleep tonight with a clear conscience and feel very happy. I feel greatly disturbed by it. Uh, because, as I said, it eliminates systems of protection that were put in place for a reason, and it does a lot of the same stuff that happened under Reagan, where all these beautiful little regulations were like, oh, we don't need that. The banks are ethical, right? We don't need these regulations. You know, they have the best interest of the country at heart, right? Um, like I said, it doesn't bother. You can ignore everything I just said right now. Forget about it. Um, you know, push the rewind button, whatever. But it disturbs me greatly, because I don't want to see uh, people in military uniform walking around um, you know, with machine guns in our cities, and that's basically what this makes possible. So, um, if you don't believe me, you can go check out the bill. As I said, it's on the Library of Congress website. As with all Congress bills, it is in, of an interminable length. Uh, it's 927 pages long, but if you look at the table of contents, you'll find the specific section, which is buried towards the back, and you will read in that language in there, basically, everything that I've been talking to you about. Senate Bill 1867 rather appropriately titled, as that was the beginning of presidential reconstruction. A um, little historical irony there. But it's Senate Bill 1867, and as I said, as you go to the back of it, you'll see that relevant clause. It's a tiny, tiny little section in it, but enough basically to uh, change change the course. Oh, you lost the mic. Yeah, I know. The, the, I lost it in multiple levels. But enough to... Uh, but, but enough to you know, to change the course of our history. So, anyway, that was all that I was going to say. We will need to get some new batteries for this. Do we have some? It's not batteries. No? It's the, uh, the Oh. Uh, the, uh, I don't know. They're turned off. Yeah, they're, they're, um, oh, they turn off. Oh, they're kicking us out, Mike. That must be the end.
different universe. Well, anyway, I'm, I'm done. Yeah. 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 Well, I think the general consensus is that uh, we did see an outstanding presentation. It's very difficult to put something like this together with uh, all these concepts. And uh, it was a very, very good uh, presentation about these uh, difficult subjects, uh, science of the day, uh, all these new discoveries and everything. Um, there's very few things that I would have any uh, quarrel about, but I do think you picked on Einstein a little bit uh, more than you should have. <laughs> because, of course, the, uh, the cosmological constant, which uh, he introduced into the theory, is, it's essentially a constant of integration, and uh, so it's an obvious thing to put in, and, uh, based on the idea that if um, the universe or physics uh, can, can allow something and it's not impossible, uh, it was logical to put it in. And as a matter of fact, it turns out that it was one of his great successes because it resulted in uh, the possibility that uh, what people are calling dark energy uh, is directly related to this cosmological constant, and which I think you mentioned. Um, the uh, thing is that uh, um, Einstein's uh, uh, theory was uh, uh, developed, pe different people found solutions uh, to the equations. One of them was called the De Sitter universe, which was the uh, one that uh, involved uh, expanding space, uh, which was an amazing thing at the time, of course. And um, Friedman then uh, did uh, um, further work and uh, discovered an expanding space-time, which actually was where the idea of the singularity that uh, is now associated with the Big Bang uh, came from, from these people that were <laughs> advancing on Einstein's theory. It didn't necessarily need a cosmological constant at that point, but uh, the fact that Einstein had it in there, not really a fudge factor, it's just, you know, well, um, Cosmic integration is just something that comes from mathematics. So, um, the amazing thing about mathematics um, is how it uh, relates to the physical world. Uh, why are these um, uh, all these things like Riemannian geometry or or spinners or, or tensors? Uh, uh, how they come to be useful? Almost the only thing in mathematics that hasn't been useful is be like, like prime number theory. I don't know the use of that in physics, but maybe there is one that I haven't heard of. Um, the uh, uh, dark energy is an amazing thing. Um, it might be an example that uh, energy can be created. It's created out of this expanding space. Um, what can it be? Can it be something related to this quantum mechanics? Uh, uh, can it have to do with these so-called virtual uh, particles that um, are frothing in an empty space? Uh, what are we going to discover about uh, what the fundamental structure of space-time is? Uh, are there something like space-time atoms? Uh, um, are uh, like the quantum loop uh, gravity is supposed to deal with that? That um, uh, one of our uh, rebutters here came up and talked about. Um, the astonishing thing about uh, extra universes. Uh, there's a good book out uh, by John Barrow called The Book of Universes. Uh, he discusses uh, the Sitter theory uh, and the Friedman universe and things like that. But also this thing about multiverses. Um, uh, I don't know if uh, Matt mentioned that there's a speculation that if these other um, bud universes exist, that maybe one will collide with ours. We might find out uh, by just being wiped out. Uh, we'll never know because supposedly uh, the, uh, uh, the fracture zone is approaching us at the speed of light and it'll just hit us without us knowing anything about it. But let us hope that these universes are completely separated, although what are they separated in if they all have their own space-time and uh, is there some kind of mega space-time out there? Well, uh, we have, maybe there's totally different parameters, uh, maybe there's a mathematics we don't know about. Uh, certainly when I was trying to figure out myself what, how you would uh, make a theory with space-time atoms, uh, uh, what kind of uh, mathematics would you use? Maybe space-time blobs, uh, quantum mechanical blobs that would, you know, fluctuate, and, you know, not have exact uh, dimensions because the dimensions would have to be consistent with special relativity. So you have a very large difficulty whenever uh, you're talking about how to uh, make a theory of uh, involving space-time atoms or space-time foam. Um, the string theorists think there might be 10 to the 500 possible universes just based on the fact of uh, how you would select a kalabi yau manifold that supposedly these uh, superstrings uh, vibrate in. Um, 
10 to the 500 possible uh, ways of um, uh, putting the holes, uh, arranging the holes in these kalabi yao uh, manifolds. I don't understand that. I can't even figure out what a kalabi man, uh, yao manifold is. But these would be the multiverses number two uh, that Matt was talking about. And uh, with 10 to the 500 possibilities, even without um, uh, shuffling the uh, fundamental constants, uh, changing the masses of the quarks, etc., etc. Uh, that's an astonishing number. Uh, if that's the case, and we are in a particular universe where we're allowed to exist, and there's 10 to the 500, or who knows, maybe 10 to the 1,000 possible universes, then we're very lucky. So, of course, we've got to try not to destroy this planet. <laughs> we don't know how many other planets there are that exist um, that um, are suitable for life. At least we know the universe that we're in, in is suitable for life. So we should try to do whatever we can not to destroy uh, our ecology and, of course, not to destroy our civil liberties, too. Okay, thank you. There's a million. There's a billion planets. I will be quick. Um, first of all, to my deist brothers and sisters, I want you to know if you go back to the original Torah and the New Testament, you'll find in it uh, the actual description of the DNA, the helical structure of the DNA. Yeah. And not only that, but in the, uh, in the Genesis, in Genesis you will find the uh, uh, end body problem solved both graphically and numerically, and you'll find uh, the uh, uh, solution to many of the, of, of, the, of the problems, the end body problem being the most significant. I think you know I'm kidding. <laughs> Ten thousand five hundred time. It's in there, Brother Lowry. I think your presentation ranks along with those of Rocky Cole, whom I've heard give the same talk many times, and that's a compliment. Um, yes. Yes. Uh, regarding the uh, superwoman uh, speeds of the uh, neutrinos that was discussed earlier, uh, that was the uh, transit of the neutrinos from a pulsed unit at uh, CERN in Switzerland to uh, the Opera uh, Opera uh, receiver in Italy. And uh, the first release of that information was based on the calculations of half of the data. Now they have finished and released just on the 24th of November uh, the calculations based on the total amount of data they collected over three years. And there is no modification in their result. The uh, additional experiments that are being done now are at uh, Kamiokande in Japan and here at Batavia at the Fermi lab. Uh, there are two experiments one aiming short pulse neutrinos to a mine in uh, Minnesota and to another one, another mine in North, Deco in North Dakota. Uh, what else do I want to talk about? My only uh, uh, fame as an astrophysicist is that I went to school with uh, Carl Sagan. <laughs> and. Uh, uh, last year at this time, I was able to falsify Kip Thorne's contention that he could detect gravitational waves uh, with an interferometer. End of talk. Okay, uh, okay. I guess I'm going to this one before Charlie got around. Charlie's going to speak. Speaker's no? got to okay. get up there yet, too, so, so be quick. Uh, I just want to say, quickly. to me, it was, a, it was a good. Uh, slide presentation and also a good survey of the, the universe. Uh, I was looking uh, at the topic though, it said life, the universe, and everything. You didn't even touch on life, but what, you touched on everything else, I believe. Sort of. And um, the question I have, and I wanted to get this in during the question period, was uh, what should I or we take home from your talk tonight? I mean, you, you, you gave us a lot of information, but usually you know, in, uh, here at the college we like to hang our uh, hats on a certain issue or with some kind of explanation uh, regarding, uh, I, uh, I personally am watching on uh, PBS 
uh, Brian Green uh, series on the fabric of the universe. Uh, the other night we had What is Matter, and he talked about the cosmological constant. The next topic I'm looking forward to is the illusion of time. And that was kind of strange because he showed a, a glass being broken and at the same time the glass being restored. So uh, I guess that tends with particle theory where you said that you roll the dice and it happens one way, you roll it another way and it happens a different way. So I think that was an allusion, uh, alluded to that. Uh, I'm also planning on giving a talk in the future uh, about super strength theory but in the sense that it's trying to identify whether it's okay. a theoretical concept of God. Oh. I have the uh, <laughs> Brian Greene's The Elegant Universe at home where he talked about super string and I would like to think that I could call on you to uh, help me with understanding super string so I could uh, converse about it. I think in answer to your uh, issue with dark matter uh, and also uh, multiple universes is that the uh, it's going to be left to the philosophers and the theologians uh, to supply the answers. Uh, since uh, we can't really rely on physics or science uh, for that. And uh, that's all I have to say. The speaker gets the last word. Yeah, yeah. you have no answers. You okay. have to run. Can I ask you one question? No, the Super Bowl. Sir, 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 can I ask you one question? Sure. There's a show on TV called The Big Bang Theory. Do you watch it? No, I don't oh, watch it. Oh, it's TV. wonderful. Watch it. No, <laughs> it's not right. It's the best. It is. It's I love the best. It. It's it's okay, okay. sure. I got all my notes here. I'm going to try to get some of you have no answer. Speaker gets the last word. Let him speak. I'm going to go in order of the butters or whatever you call them. As far as acacia and tannic acid, humans are not trees. <laughs> uh, uh, I don't care because I hate the taste of coffee anyway. Uh, <clears throat> as far as the question about general relativity and chemistry, uh, as far as I know, general relativity is of questionable relevance to standard chemistry. However, perhaps with ideas like stream theory or loop quantum gravity and the Large Hadron Collider, we'll see otherwise. Uh, concerning the Casimir effect, it may or may not be related to dark energy. Who the hell knows? Uh, basic research should and must be supported because we never know where it will lead and realistically if we don't do it somehow someone else will. Uh, Einstein was actually originally trying, when he was doing his unification work, he was trying to unify electricity and magnetism in general relativity. He wasn't trying to unify general relativity with quantum mechanics. It actually ends up that uh, electricity and magnetism is act, it's actually part of quantum mechanics and what's called the standard model of particle physics. Uh, and also to the point about energy reforming, it doesn't always necessarily quote reform or the contradiction of the second law of thermodynamics. Uh, the question of the universe being infinite is an open question we simply don't know. One of the beautiful things about science, in my opinion, is it's almost like the opposite of dogmatism because it's always open to being revised based on new evidence. I will not speak to economic questions because I'm no economist, though I am interested in reading Adam Smith's work. Uh, don't bother. Carl Sagan's work with Cosmos is one of the reasons why I am interested in science as well as why I'm a teacher. It's what inspired me when I was a young man. This emphasizes the importance of education and helping kids stay curious. On the question of uh, war on terror and confessions and whatnot, coerced confessions have been shown to not be reliable, so putting all the ethics and the moral arguments aside, if your goal is to get accurate, actionable intelligence, chances are coerced confessions are not the way to do it. Because it usually doesn't work out as the way you want. Uh, concerning the question of uh, God and whatnot, uh, I'm an atheist, though I call myself an Epicurean. Uh, and uh, I'm not an atheist because of science per se, though my training in science does inform that a little bit. I'm, at, I'm an atheist because of my philosophical analysis for the existence of God. I, th I think much of the question on whether or not a God exists depends a great deal on how you define God. To me, I see no necessary contradiction between a disconnected, uncaring, deistic God and science. By the way, my wife is a Christian and I meditate. Ah, the idea of blessing water, shades of Thales of Miletus. Uh, incidentally, fear isn't always necessarily a bad thing, as I think it can be used to motivate us in positive ways. Don't fear fear, embrace it as needed. By the way, when I meditate, I'm just sitting. <laughs> I also agree that there is more in the world than science, 
And because of this, I'm interested in actually obtaining a degree, possibly an advanced degree in philosophy in the near future. Huh. On Senate Bill 1867, all I can say is real patriots ask questions. Concerning uh, Einstein and his mistake or whatnot, funny thing is, at first it looked like he screwed up, but then in the end, maybe he ended up not screwing up after all. Uh, we could potentially detect other universes if, as was said, they indeed collided with ours, and we would probably have to do this through an analysis of analyzing various features of the cosmic microwave background. Uh, concerning the number of multiverses, a la string theory, 10 to the 500s, kind of makes you wonder whether or not there's another you out there somewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, that's deep. Huh. Solutions in the Torah. Sounds like data mining to me. Ha -ha. Uh, regarding superluminal, superluminal neutrinos, we'll just have to wait and see what comes up in terms of the laboratory work. And take whatever else you want from this tonight, but at least go with this. Science is cool. Hey. And if you have a question, uh, feel free to contact me through my website, skepticalteacher.org. Thank you. Uh, Thanks for having me.